Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us to uh, today's webinar. Uh, of course, originally we planned uh, to have an occasion when we can introduce our proposals to the public uh, in a more physical form. But unfortunately, uh, COVID-19, with the many other things together, it swept away uh, our plans to, to have a personal meeting with those who are interested and involved in uh, the next uh, MFF discussions and uh, to have an exchange of views how cities can have a better access to EU funding for their fights against climate change and um, the post-COVID uh, recovery uh, programs. Um, just for a short uh, technical uh, announcement, um, the first speaker, who is the mayor of Budapest, uh, Mr. Gergely Karacsony, will speak in Hungarian, uh, but you have an English interpretation. Um, uh, in the bottom of your screen, you uh, see a small um, picture interpretation. You have to switch it on English, and then uh, you will get the English interpretation for his speech. And uh, then when he uh, is at the end of his speech, you can switch it back to the original audio. Uh, the rest of the, the webinar will be held in English, uh, so you won't need uh, further interpretation um, in the later parts of the, uh, of the meeting. And uh, again, I would like to say uh, thank you for uh, all of our um, speakers uh, who agreed to be with us today. And uh, for those who joined us this early morning time to listen how uh, cities can get better uh, EU funding uh, for the uh, climate action and um, um, COVID, uh, post-COVID recovery plans. And with that, uh, I would like to directly pass the floor uh, to the mayor of Budapest, Mr. Gergely Karacsony. Thank Heartfelt welcome to everyone. Uh, the mayor of Budapest. Please allow me to Yes, let's start it again. Heartfelt welcome to everyone from Budapest. Please allow me to start the introduction of this webinar uh, from a bit further, both in space and time. Although I think that uh, quite soon we are going to get back to the original topic, that is uh, how cities can play a role in fighting against climate change. In the recent period, probably we've been using the word never seen or unfor never seen or unparalleled uh, for a lot of things that we've gone through and yes indeed if we think about uh, the wildfires in australia uh, which uh, have uh, caused the devastation never seen devastation never experienced devastation in uh, the uh, nature and we also show that the well organized state is also um, unable uh, to step up against uh, the environment, against uh, the turbulent nature. Therefore, it is now clear to everyone that this is not only a climate change, this is a devastating climate crisis that is going on on our planet. And obviously, uh, the COVID pandemic, the corona pandemic, which obviously have det has determined the lives of uh, each and everyone on this planet. It's a crisis we uh, cannot even see the depth and uh, the width of that crisis. We, however, know that this is also uh, interrelated with climate crisis because uh, there is a scientific consensus uh, that uh, Virus uh, infections uh, transmitted from animals to humans uh, is uh, actually increased if uh, the nature is, is exploited. Now, the 
significance of the ecological crisis cannot be overestimated. And uh, even the most optimistic people say that we are in the last moment uh, to have a consensus overarching ideologies, uh, overarching um, uh, continents and borders and boundaries uh, in order to join forces uh, to try to avoid the disaster. Thanks God, uh, the systematic changes, the importance of systematic change is now understood by political decision makers, even if they are late in doing so. This is especially true uh, for this especially stands for uh, the European Commission, which in last November um, announced uh, the European Green Deal, the European Green Pact, uh, the draft thereof uh, involving um, the citizens and the, the business sphere in order to uh, decarbonize uh, uh, world till 2050, uh, decarbonize Europe till 2050, sorry. It is important to emphasize that uh, this objective is inevitable. This is what it takes to save our planet, but this is not only a sacrifice, but this is also an opportunity for us because uh, that would result uh, in sustainable power generation uh, in a circular economy. The green uh, shift uh, would not only preserve the environment, but it would also create jobs and also has a major innovation potential. It is uh, in the interest of each and every European citizen and the interest of uh, each and every uh, one on the planet to have Europe pioneering this process. The European Commission helyes irányt és kitűzte a szükséges célokat. A mai uh, beszélgetésünk témája. Today our discussion, the topic of our discussion today is uh, that in order to achieve the pan-European objectives, the European Union will have to realize and will have to accept uh, the strategic alliance of uh, local governments. But it is not, our objective is not only to make uh, Europe and the European Commission um, realize that, but also to create and provide a funding, um, funding which would make this alliance and this cooperation possible. And the old principle of green policy, politics, that is uh, to um, think globally and act locally, that would really uh, be a reality that would really happen. Now, from this, realizing this fact, uh, the mayors of uh, the V4 countries uh, with uh, Bratislava, uh, Prague and Warsaw and Budapest, we started a, a European movement. We have uh, written a letter to the leaders of the European institutions in which we have, uh, uh, we have uh, explained uh, uh, the De nem álltunk meg itt. Az elmúlt hónapban eh, kialakítottuk azt a pozíciós papert, amely meg kifejtettük, hogy melyik azok a konkrét jogszabályalkotások, azok a konkrét lépések, amelyek lehetővé teszik ezeket a közvetlen finanszírozási mechanizmusokat. Ehhez a dokumentumhoz is a mai napig 22 európai város csatlakozott Párizstól Rigán át Barcelonáig. Ezeket a konkrét megoldási javaslatokat Jámor Benedek barátom és kollégám volt LP képviselő Budapest Brüsszeli Dálnak vezetője fogja részletesen bemutatni. A városok Európa szerte szeretnének kivenni a részüket a klímavédelemből, hiszen a üveg házgázok jelentős hányada a városi körzetben termelődik, a klíma mitigáció és az adaptációból fakadó kihívások nagy része a nagyvárosokban kezelhetőek. És tegyük hozzá, hogy nincs ez másképp a koronavírus válság okozta a gazdaság és társadalmi krízis kezelésével sem. Az Európai Unió a lokális szinergiák erősítésével Kisebb volumenű, de rendkívül gyors és hatékonyan kivitelezhető projektekkel segítheti a klímavételmi intézkedéseket határokon átnyúló városi projektek támogatásával, hatékonyabb forrás felhasználásával nagyon komoly, hatékony lépéseket tehetünk a céljaink elérés érdekében.
hogy egy budapesti példát mondjak, Budapest főváros épületszigetelési projektekkel, vagy a közösségi közlekedés zöldítésével nagyon nagy mértékben tudná csökkenteni Magyarország káros anyag kibocsájtását. De a városok stratégiai partnersége nem csak a klímavédelmi intézkedések hatékonyságát, de az Európai Unió demokratikus működését is szolgálhatják. Az európai városlakók az EU lakosságának háromnegyedét teszik ki. Közvetlenül választott, erős legitimitással bíró vezetőik vannak. Olyan társadalmi közeget jelentenek, ahol a lakosság elkötelezett az ambiciózus, progresszív célok elérés érdekében. És ezek a helyi kormányzatok közelebb vannak az emberekhez, mint a nemzeti, vagy pedig az Európai Uniós intézmények. Az önkormányzatok egyfajta hidet tudnak képezni a polgárok számára sokszor távolinak tűnő Európai Uniós intézmények és a saját életük között. Ezért a városok intenzívebb bevonása nem csak a klímakrízis, de az Európai Unióban meglévő demokrácia deficit leküzdését is szolgálhatja. Tudjuk azt, hogy a javaslatunk nem teljes mértékben új, és tudjuk azt, hogy a legnagyobb Európai Városi Szövetség, a Eurocities, vagy az Európai Régiók Bizottsága is képviseli ezeket a szempontokat. És örülünk annak, hogy legutóbb az Európai Zöld Párt tett támogató nyilatkozatot az Európai Bizottság vezetői felé ebben a témában. Szadikán Oldani főpolgármester társam sokszor idézi azt a mondatot, hogy a 19. század a birodalmak, a 20. század a nemzetállamok, a 21. század pedig a városok kora lehet. Én a magam részéről talán nem lennék ennyire optimista. Tudjuk és elfogadjuk, hogy az európai integráció elsősorban a nemzetállamok együttműködéseként jött létre, és ez így is fog maradni de a helyi szint megerősítése egy kiváló lehetőség arra, hogy az Európai Unió hatékonyabban nézen szembe a globális kihívásokkal, és erősítse azt az állampolgári közösséget, amely létrejött az európai eszme zászlaja alatt, és amely ma irányt mutathat a Föld minden döntéshozója számára. Partnerséget szeretnénk tehát, hiszen tudjuk azt, hogy milyen óriási a közös felelősségünk a kontinensünkkel, a hazánkkal és a bolygó egészével kapcsolatosan. Az európai nagyvárosok szeretnének osztozni ebben a felelősségben. Nagyon szépen köszönöm, hogy itt vannak velünk. Ez egy nagyon fontos vita. Remélem, hogy sorsfordító is. És remélem, hogy a nap végén, a beszélgetés végén látjuk azokat a konkrét cselekvéseket is, amelyek segítik ezeknek a nagyszerű közös céloknak az elérését. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for uh, your opening uh, remarks. Uh, and now I would like to pass the floor to the co-chair of the Greens IFA group in the European Parliament, my old friend and former colleague, um, Mr. Philippe Lambertz. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bense, and, uh, and hello, uh, Gergely. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you today, even if I much prefer uh, physical meetings to virtual ones, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we will be able to, uh, to meet again in the not too distant future. Let me share the news about uh, the state of play in Brussels in terms of budget, because this meeting is about uh, leveraging the European budget uh, by cities that are motivated to uh, enter the green transition. Uh, I have good news and bad news. The, let me start with the bad news so that uh, they are behind us. 
if you look at the seven year uh, budget that is foreseen by the uh, European Union and that has been proposed by the Commission for the next seven years, I have bad news because this is a budget that is shrinking, uh, whose green ambition is so and so. I would say basically uh, it commits to spend 25% of the budget on climate related stuff, but that also means that 75% of the budget is not really aligned with that and uh, you know that for instance a common agricultural policy is not really uh, green at the moment and there's a, and this is a significant chunk of the uh, European budget. So if I just look at that component of the Commission proposal uh, there's reason to be worried. But then again uh, there's good news because indeed uh, as uh, Gerge said the Commission uh, for the first time has made the green transition, albeit maybe an insufficient version of it, but uh, a core of its strategy. Remember when Jean-Claude Juncker left us uh, uh, eight or, or, or nine months ago, he made a speech about these five years, and believe me, during that speech, he did not mention the word climate once. He did not mention the word environment once. That means that basically uh, up until Jean-Claude Juncker, the European Commission was pretty much uh, oblivious to the environmental challenges that we, have to, uh, that we have to meet. And conversely, when Ursula von der Leyen came on board, she made the European Green Deal the heart of her uh, strategy. And that is a sea change. And indeed, uh, you might criticize the European Green Deal for not being ambitious enough, not being coherent enough, when you look at agricultural policy, as I said, or uh, trade policy, yet, frankly speaking, this is a massive step forward, at least at the love level of the intentions. And then Corona hits. And you could hear uh, from all across Europe voices uh, immediately reacting, saying, well, now that we have the pandemic, uh, we have to forget about European Green Deal because we have no time for that. We have to fight the pandemic and uh, keep our economies from crashing. But actually, when you listen to those voices, these were the very same that opposed the Green Deal in the first place. I mean, the car industry, the coal industry, a number of uh, member states basically were already complaining about the European Green Deal and were simply using the alibi of the, uh, of the pandemic to restate and, and redress their, uh, uh, their, uh, their complaints about the European Green Deal. The good news, and that's the first very important good news, is that from the European Commission, but I must say from the European Parliament's majority as well, and I know that I have a number of colleagues uh, uh, speaking later on, on, on this same program, we are a majority in the Parliament and there's a dedicated will in the European Commission to make the Green Deal, to keep the Green Deal at the heart of the recovery and resilience strategy. And I would say even more so, after the pandemic hit. And that's a first good news. So, at least from Brussels, Commission and Parliament, there is no will to let the Green Deal fall by the wayside. The question is still open on the side of the European Council, that is the heads of states and government. And there you will witness in the coming weeks the same struggles that we have seen before uh, between those member states who are uh, reasonably enthusiastic about the Green Deal, though that are, that are middle of the road and though those who are really dead against. And so these debates will come back. So the battle is still not won, but at least from Parliament and Commission, there's a clear will to make the Green Deal at the heart of the recovery strategy. First good news. Second good news is that even if the basic budget for the next seven years is too weak, uh, is not aligned enough with the Green Deal. The good news is that the European Commission has proposed a recovery and resilience plan, what is now called Next Generation EU, which is, again, maybe not enough, but frankly speaking, it's a massive plan, 750 billion, whose architecture is basically right. So we are going, if we follow that proposal, to borrow together to meet the consequences of the pandemic and we are going to spend that money together, especially where it is mostly needed. So it is what I call a time-limited fiscal union that is also limited in scope. So a fiscal union limited in time and in scope, but if 
we get this approved, and if we execute the right way, it may pave the way to a more permanent fiscal union. So this is absolutely crucial for Europe. And there again, we have the issue of, are we going to align the recovery and resilience plan with the Green Deal? On paper, the answer is yes, in the proposal of the Commission. Now, if you scratch beneath the surface, you find some worrying signals. Let me take a few examples. We have in the Just Transition Fund, that was the first proposal after the European Green Deal, so a fund, a limited fund, that is there to help countries that are mostly dependent on fossil fuels. There, there was this principle that no euro cent of that fund could be spent on fossil energies. Logical. Well, we do not find this principle copy-pasted into the Recovery and Resilience Fund proposed by the European Commission. Another two principles are important. The principle of uh, what we call following the green taxonomy. That is, this is a nomenclature of what we can consider as green investments. We have in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Just Transition Fund again, we have, and, and in the InvestEU program, we have the principle that we have to follow so the investments must respect the green taxonomy. In other terms, the money must go to investments that are qualifying as green. Well, this commitment or this demand has not been copy-pasted in the uh, recovery and resilience funds. Likewise, there's a very important aspect of the Green Deal, which is the do-no-harm principle. And the principle is, okay, we invest in fighting climate, but also all the rest of the money that we are spending cannot go against that goal of fighting climate change and restoring biodiversity and all the rest of it. This principle is again of application in the InvestEU program, but not in the recovery and resilience fund. So these are signals that make you perceive that maybe uh, behind uh, the, the headline goal of aligning the recovery and resilience fund with the Green Deal, well, there's too much fuzziness. There's not enough constraints that will make sure that indeed most of the money will be spent in accordance with the European Green Deal. So I've told you this is basically the shape of the battle to come. First aspect of the battle, convince the member states, and that's really for the next few weeks. So there's council meetings next week, and normally there will be another uh, or another two council meetings in July to agree on the principle and the architecture of this uh, recovery fund. Hopefully, the Council will find an agreement and of course the Parliament will be on board as well. But then the question will be, how green is that recovery and resilience fund going to be? And that is the next battle. And that battle will be fought over the autumn to make sure that indeed the money that comes on top of the seven-year budget, with the, what we call the MFF, uh, the significant money that is going to be spent over the next three years, uh, well, that money will be invested in uh, green projects. And if we succeed in those two battles, first, making the recovery and resilience fund a reality, and second, making sure that that reality is a green reality, if we win those two battles, then indeed, the cities in Europe will have uh, an immense opportunity to draw on these, uh, uh, on these new funds in order to execute uh, the transition. Gergely is right. Uh, most of the people now live in, in, uh, in cities in Europe, and the cities have an absolutely key role to play in the transition, and I think that the, the pandemic has shown that. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, read this morning the fact that uh, because of the confinement, the emissions of cities like Paris, Brussels, etc., have been going down drastically. But you know what? The confinement is there, and we are back to the old normal. That is highly polluting cities, and we have to do something. So, um, how should I say, the battles have yet to be fought. Uh, I'm naturally an optimistic guy, uh, but I do believe that uh, those who resist against the green change are now on the defensive, and it's the time for us to go on the offensive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, um, for this welcome speech, and I think that you um, drafted very well the situation where uh, we live in um, and um, now let me to uh, introduce uh, our
proposals in details, uh, what um, the position paper we prepared together with um, the other Visegrad capital cities, which is already backed by a number of additional cities from all over Europe, look like? What are the, the concrete um, proposals? And for that, I have a little presentation, uh, PowerPoint, um, and I hope it's much better than just looking at me. Um, so how can we, um, in practice, create a better, more accessible or direct European funding for cities to achieve the climate goals and to be able to contribute um, significantly to our joint uh, European targets, uh, climate targets for 2030, uh, which is still unclear uh, where we are going to be in 2030. If uh, um, finally um, the discussions between the institutions will uh, be resulted in the originally proposed 55% uh, 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 emission reduction by 2030. Um, we hope that um, the institutions are going to be uh, ambitious enough uh, to set this framework for, for European member states and economies and societies. But what and how uh, European cities can contribute to uh, this uh, time. Um, now we are living in an age which um, uh, represents a multiple challenge for our cities. It was uh, quite clearly described by Mayor Karachan and by uh, Philippe Lambert as well, that um, a climate change um, has um, a major and significant effect on our cities. A fair share of the needed emission cuts must happen in uh, big cities and met metropolitan areas. Also the consequences of climate change hit our cities very strongly and uh, well-being of over 70% of the EU citizens living in cities is highly dependent on uh, climate adaptation of our cities. So there is a, a lot at stake in the cities when uh, we talk about climate change, but that's quite the same with the COVID-19 um, pandemic and crisis. Uh, cities, our cities were and still are in the front line of the fight against uh, coronavirus. A lot of um, measures must have been introduced by the, the cities. They bear the cost of uh, many of those uh, measures. The confinement and, and health costs are um, paid by, by the cities. And uh, there is an increased and very strong pressure on local social systems, which is also managed uh, by the cities uh, mostly. And the economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis uh, also hits the cities very strongly. Um, we have to take uh, into consideration that, uh, for example, the falling of the local tax incomes, um, including uh, tourism tax, local business taxes, and so on and so forth. Um, um, it creates a very difficult situation to the, to the city budget. Um, and um, there is a great variety uh, in the member states how far the national governments are trying to uh, support and uh, help the cities in this difficult situation. But also there are some additional problems and just to mention one, which uh, in the case of Budapest is, is clearly one of the, uh, the most important ones. That's for example, uh, the losses in public transport fees uh, is close to 20 billion foreigns up to now. Um, which is um, uh, close to 15% of the city budget, uh, yearly city budget, um, which is um, uh, really a major loss uh, why um, the public transport uh, must have been run uh, by the cities even during uh, the confinement days. Uh, so the, the, the climate change uh, represents a major challenge for our cities. Uh, our cities were in the front line of the fight against uh, COVID-19 and the economic effects are really strong in the cities. Still, we have to um, take into consideration that uh, European cities are very much committed uh, to be front runners of uh, all of those fights. Local communities very often are much more ambitious in climate action than the national governments. That's definitely the case in Central and Eastern Europe. 
And um, when we started our cooperation with uh, other uh, Visegrad uh, capital cities, with Prague, Warsaw, and Bratislava, um, we had to, uh, to realize very soon that um, our thinking about climate change um, differs very much from our national government's uh, approach to um, European and national and local level uh, climate actions. As also it was mentioned by Mayor Karachoin, cities and regions are, are much closer to the citizens and they may know better what uh, the citizens' local communities really need and what uh, they are ready to do uh, in the fight against climate change. Already there are excellent city initiatives. Um, as a um, clear evidence uh, that uh, cities are committed in the fight against climate change, just to mention a few, Covenant of Mayors, uh, the C40 initiative, uh, also the Eurocities um, um, had its voice um, in climate talks. So the cities are already communicating and organizing themselves uh, to become effective and to give a major contribution to the global and European level efforts in, in climate action. And also we have uh, many best practices in the fight against COVID-19 and also in, in uh, climate action in the cities, which are there to share with each other, with other cities, but not only cities, some of the initiatives, uh, pilot projects and best practices in the cities uh, can be applied also on the national level. Um, but cities need additional backing, um, political, um, regulatory help, but also financial sources uh, to maximize uh, their contribution to uh, our efforts against climate change and COVID-19. Um, and um, um, these necessary EU measures are repeatedly uh, were claimed and proposed by uh, city uh, networks like Eurocities and also the Committee of the Regions and so on and so forth. A few words about the, the V4 initiative, uh, which was already mentioned and introduced by Mayor Coracho. In the Visegrad capitals are in a special situation. Mostly uh, the opposition of the cities um, or, or the leadership of the cities uh, are in opposition uh, of uh, or today very often populistic uh, governments, which creates a very strange situation where, uh, where the, the city leadership differs from uh, the national or member states uh, governments. And this, in some cases, creates um, difficult conflicts between uh, capital cities and uh, the governments. And as I mentioned, um, our cities in the region are much more ambitious in climate policies than uh, the Central and Eastern European member states, or most of them. Um, from this um, conviction, um, or that conviction led us to um, have the meeting at the end of uh, 2019 in December when mayors uh, of the Visegrad four capitals met in Budapest and signed the Pact of Free Cities. Uh, to learn from each other, to back uh, each other, uh, to maintain the pro-European, progressive, uh, pro-climate action uh, political line of the cities, and to step up together on the European level uh, to represent our interest and to um, exchange our views with the European institutions and other cities all over Europe. Uh, Mayor Karachin already mentioned that in February we sent a joint letter to the presidents of uh, the institutions, the Commission, the European Parliament and the Council uh, in February. Um, 32 additional cities signed uh, already that uh, letter from very different member states uh, in the EU. In this letter we were asking for easily accessible and direct funding for cities in the next multi-annual financial framework and the next EU uh, budget. As a follow-up of this joint letter, uh, we prepared in the last few months uh, a detailed position paper how this claim of the cities can be translated into practical changes in uh, regulation and uh, in, in the European budget and uh, MFF uh, proposal uh, to improve accessibility of uh, EU sources for cities. That was prepared in cooperation with the V4 Capitals, 
but already uh, almost 20 other cities joined to the initiative for, from very different parts of Europe. So it's not uh, a simple Central and Eastern European initiative from Oulu on the, in the north of Finland to Barcelona um, in Catalonia and uh, from Paris uh, to Bialystok in, in Poland. There are very different cities joining the initiative and this initiative um, is uh, opened, uh, so we are um, still calling for other cities to join us. Let's have a look uh, to the proposals. Basically, there are six areas uh, where we see that uh, there is a need for uh, amendments uh, to the existing regulation to make it uh, um, better fit to the needs of the cities. The first is the already proposed European Urban Initiative, which is a directly managed uh, European uh, source uh, for, for cities. Uh, but we believe uh, that the framework of the European Urban Initiative is too low. It's around 500 million euros for the 27 member states for a seven years period. It's um, really not enough anything else than just pilot projects and some, some innovative uh, actions. We believe that uh, it must be increased uh, to, a, to a level at least 2 billion uh, euros and to the priorities of the European uh, Urban Initiative, sustainability must be added. Uh, EUI uh, must support strategic actions in favor of green and just transition of cities and urban areas. There is uh, the textual proposal. I don't expect you to read it very quickly, just to show that we have a very detailed textual proposal on how EUI should be amended during the negotiations in the Parliament and in the Council and during uh, the interinstitutional uh, negotiations uh, to make it much uh, more effective for cities and urban uh, metropolitan areas. The second area is the sustainable urban development, again an already existing um, framework, uh, which is uh, in the ERDF uh, regulation. Um, and uh, already uh, the European Commission proposal uh, proposes to um, allocate 6% of uh, the, uh, the money there to sustainable urban development programs. First, we believe that this must be increased to at least 10%, so a higher amount of money should be allocated to the sustainable urban development program. Secondly, what is uh, also very important, that it's not only about the amount of money, but about the way of the management of the money, and uh, we believe that uh, we must uh, strengthen the role of urban, urban authorities in the planning of the sustainable urban development programs. So what could be uh, um, included in uh, the CUD uh, programs? Uh, secondly, uh, there is a need for a deep involvement of urban authorities in the management of the CUD uh, programs. So when it comes to the practical allocation of the money, also urban authorities must be there. And finally, uh, if there is a case of non-compliance with the principle of partnership, this should be taken very seriously and uh, sanctions should be introduced right here and now uh, when the Commission realizes that the principle of uh, partnership is not respected by the member state governments and the national management authorities, they warn uh, the management authority and the member states, but there are no really effective tools for the, uh, the Commission to force the member states uh, to take seriously and to apply properly the principle of partnership. Again, there is a very detailed proposal how uh, this should be done. The third area is uh, the Connecting Europe facility, which uh, of course is much more about uh, connecting different regions and member states in Europe. But sometimes in the cities, we have um, essential um, projects, um, um, intermodal uh, nodes and so on and so forth, which are essential to, uh, to make the European networks functioning uh, well. And uh, we believe that um, to make the Connecting Europe facility uh, the most effective um, program or measure possible 
uh, for the EU, uh, also uh, cities and, and urban areas or municipalities uh, should be eligible uh, to apply for Connecting Europe facility uh, sources. Again, um, uh, the amendment was um, um, prepared in details how to make this. The fourth and uh, perhaps a less clear area of uh, city funding is the Green New Deal, which was um, uh, mentioned by Philip Lambert as well. And of course, we are very happy to see the Green New uh, Deal. Still, there are some uncertainties regarding the de details of uh, Green New Deal. So uh, we listed uh, some uh, key areas uh, where cities are really interested to influence the Green New Deal. First of all, we believe that uh, in the planning and uh, the applying of the Green New Deal, we must strengthen the cooperation between the EU and the local, the municipal and regional uh, level on climate uh, governance. It's not simply the member states which are, which are partners um, uh, of the European Commission and the EU institutions when it comes to, to climate uh, action and climate governance, but cities and municipalities uh, also should be taken into consideration and uh, take on board um, uh, in climate uh, diplomacy and climate governance. Secondly, we must uh, create easily accessible financing strands for cities, uh, not only in climate, but also in the circular economy, the sustainable water management, air quality, transport decarbonization, and other projects, which are also priorities of the, uh, the Green New Deal. Um, but still, the sources for those projects and those areas are given to the hands of the member states. Um, uh, cities, urban authorities uh, must be there uh, when um, uh, there, there is the planning of uh, those programs and also when they execute uh, the Green New Deal uh, programs. The third issue with the Green New Deal is the, uh, the Just Transition Fund and the Just Transition Mechanism, um, which um, at its, its present form uh, targets very much um, uh, the core regions of uh, the EU. But, but we believe that the just transition does not simply mean uh, to give financial support for cool regions, but to um, assure for our societies that everybody is on board with the green climate transition of the EU. And there are important areas in the cities, for example, in building renovation programs for low income uh, groups, where uh, the Just Transition Fund and Just Transition Mechanism should be made available for cities to finance uh, those programs, at least in the second and third pillar, the InvestEU and the EIB programs uh, of the uh, JTM, uh, because the Just Transition does not simply mean to take on board uh, uh, cool areas, but also to include uh, the, the whole society uh, including the low-income groups to our green uh, climate transition. And also we raise the idea on the long term uh, for the possibility of a separate climate neutrality policy, which is similar to uh, the common agricultural policy or the cohesion policy with an own budget uh, in uh, the MFF. Uh, the fifth area is Horizon Europe. The Horizon Europe is a 100 billion euros program in the next MFF. Um, and uh, uh, according to the proposal uh, by the Commission, there will be missions to concentrate the sources of the Horizon Europe. One of those missions is the Climate Neutral and Smart Cities mission, which is very good news for our cities. Um, and we fully back the idea of uh, having this mission. Uh, the mission board uh, of uh, the Climate Neutral and Smart Cities already prepared a concept uh, which proposes to have 100 cities in the EU to become climate neutral by 2030 and to allocate sources to help them to achieve uh, this goal um, uh, and also proposes a complex financing uh, scheme involving ERDF, ESF, JTF and other uh, EU instruments. As cities, we fully agree with the conclusion of the mission board and strongly support the idea of combining different European financial tools to completely tap the potential of cities and urban areas in the decarbonizing Europe by 2050. And we urge the Commission to endorse 
the ideas and proposals made by the mission board of um, uh, the climate neutral and smart cities uh, uh, mission uh, proposal. Uh, and uh, finally, um, also the COVID-19 recovery plan is um, on our radar. Uh, when we prepared uh, our proposal, um, uh, the new generation EU proposal was still not out. Uh, so um, we were not able to react directly uh, to the written form of the new generation EU proposal. But of course, the main uh, framework of the recovery plan was already known. So we believe that uh, in the recovery plan, the financial sources and instruments um, it goes mostly to the member states to tackle coronavirus and its consequences. We believe that cities were and are in the front line of the fight against COVID-19. Uh, they are really hit heavily by social and economic consequences. So we call for support schemes targeting cities and tailor-made to their needs, uh, which means direct and or uh, easily accessible sources for cities in the recovery plan. Uh, to compensate specifically losses of cities uh, incomes and contribute to the extra costs and uh, to have the green transition uh, among these new circumstances. It was thought by um, uh, the president of uh, the uh, committee of the, uh, the regions, I think in a very straightforward way to compensate income tax losses EU mechanism to allow local and regional governments to have direct access to funding scheme should be developed. Regional and local communities must be supported to re-engineer public services to make them digital, sustainable and resilient. The EU should provide new funds and simplified procedures for sustainable local infrastructure and support SMEs via post-pandemic strand in the InvestEU fund. That's um, uh, where we are. Uh, we prepared our proposals, uh, detailed amendment level proposals. Of course, this is um, uh, just a position paper. And as cities, we are open for further discussion with additional cities to include them to our joint um, efforts to uh, convince European institutions to ensure uh, easily accessible direct funding for cities and we are open for uh, the discussion with the EU institutions in the coming weeks when the proposals go uh, to the European Parliament and uh, to the Council for further discussion. Our proposal can be read, it's uh, on the uh, website of uh, the city of uh, Budapest, uh, um, but also you can um, get access to it uh, via email or uh, Twitter account of the representation of the city of Budapest uh, uh, in Brussels or my Twitter. So thank you for your uh, attention and um, um, listening to this uh, introduction. Um, you will have the opportunity to, to make questions um, at the end of this panel, but first uh, we, have the opportunity and the honor to listen to the political groups of the European uh, Parliament. And um, I would like to give the floor first uh, to Vice Chair of the Renew Europe uh, Group, um, uh, Katalin Che, uh, to give his uh, contribution to this discussion and perhaps an insight uh, to the discussions uh, inside the, the Renew Europe group in the European Parliament. Katalin, the floor is yours. Don't forget to unmute your mic. Thank you, Bent, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, extremely thought-provoking and very, very current uh, discussion. Uh, I think really this is one of the most important talks we should be having now, how to help local communities uh, to fight climate change, how to make the best use of the European Union's fu funds. And well, I mean, I, I really think that now is really the time to be bold and to risk things that uh, were deemed impossible even a few months ago. Uh, because really COVID-19 challenges institutions like nothing has in our lifetimes, in my opinion. And it also pushes us all towards uh, new ideas to 
deliver effective and timely support to our citizens and to rethink the way we uh, used to work. And uh, I do believe that a very serious reform is necessary in our existing structures. Neither the pandemic emergency nor the climate emergency will limit itself to our legal boundaries. It is just simply not possible to tackle uh, new challenges with old, uh, old methods. And for this, I would like to offer uh, my perspective, uh, highlighting some issues that are very dear to my heart. Uh, first, uh, as I'm a member of the Parliament's Budgetary Control Committee, I would like to speak very shortly about uh, how this proposal on the table can improve the efficiency and control of EU spending, something that we really need now because we need every single euro cent to go to the best place. Secondly, I would like to address on how this proposal can strengthen the link between the EU and its citizens, also something we need very much now. And thirdly, how climate action can benefit from more direct funding to cities, the biggest topic of this seminar, obviously. Um, but before I start, I just want to drop in an important principle to the EU for further consideration. And this is the principle of subsidiarity. And very strictly speaking, this principle means that where the EU has no exclusive competence and action can be more effective closer to the people, uh, their legislation or other measures should be done by the member states. But if we do not speak so strictly, this also means that local or regional governments can act more efficiently than they uh, should be able to take the possibility, uh, the, pre the precedence over the actions of the member states. Because the lower you go, the closer you are to the problems. And this principle, it really guarantees the independent functioning of the lower authorities. And this is what we have to keep in mind when uh, we make new laws and we think about how we function. This principle very often comes up also in legislation, uh, whether we can legislate better on European level or lower level. Uh, but I think uh, we hear less about it when it comes about the distribution of European funds. Although very often regions, cities, or even civil organizations uh, can tackle specific problems better than national governments, it's not really addressed in the discussion. But I, I think this is time for us to, to drop this bomb in and uh, create a stair uh, in, in the house and also in other chambers. Because the proposal we are discussing today is really a tangible solution, in my opinion, for more effective European funds. It strengthens this direct link between EU institutions and the final beneficiaries. And by doing so, it is also a promising way to increase efficiency so that funding finds its way to citizens who need it the most. We cannot waste money now. And through a stronger oversight from the Commission, it also promises to protect the uh, financial interests of the citizens on both the receiving ends and also the contributing ends. Because if our money is being misused, everybody is harmed. Uh, we heard the uh, remarks of the Hungarian uh, uh, mayor, uh, Mr. Karácsony, and I think Hungary is something like, uh, um, like really a case study uh, in, in many regards uh, when it comes to efficiency and spending and problems of controls, unfortunately. Because in our case, there are very clear indications for the ineffective use of EU funds. Cohesion funds very often increase difference and not reduce it. Misuse and fraud of funds, uh, corruption is unfortunately a very serious problem. There are clear indications that something needs to be done. Of course, I could give you countless insights uh, from my constituents, from people I talk to, but let me rather cite an analysis of the European Commission. Um, because in March 2018, at the Budgetary Control Committee, the chief of the DG Regio, Mark Lemaitre, he presented an evaluation of cohesion policy in the four Visegrad countries. And he was stressing that relative to the, uh, its GDP, Hungary consistently received the most EU funds compared to Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. Well, this is, well as a Hungarian, I should be happy about it, right? Uh, but despite receiving the most funds, Mark Lemaitre uh, characterized Hungary as, I quote, um, visibly performing less well than the other three countries, and that is true in almost every relevant indicator, GDP growth, poverty rate, labor market indicators. Now, this for me is a very puzzling development. A country 
that receives the most funds, it benefits the least from them. I believe it's quite fair to assume that increasing efficiency and control could be the key to this puzzle. And now when we approach the next budgetary cycle, we very urgently need to find reassuring tools to ensure that in the next cycle, funds will be spent in a way that will benefit a broader group of uh, citizens, that our money will be put to better use and help more. And I think that more funds, uh, final beneficence can apply for directly. It's a prime example for uh, such tools which can rebuild trust and also protect citizens' financial interest on both the contributing and receiving ends. Good for everybody. But in my opinion, we cannot stop here. We need effective anti-corruption guarantees like a mandatory, I think it really should be mandatory, and well-funded European Public Prosecutor's Office. We should talk more about this institution. But also in the same vein, uh, there are so many uh, new legislative uh, initiatives uh, that are being raised in Parliament. Uh, specifically to, to tackle misuse and direct funds to those who need it the most. I also uh, tabled an amendment that was voted, uh, which proposed an EU blacklist of uh, fraudulent applicants, but there are so many other approaches uh, to, to this, but it should be talked about. But the second strength of this proposal made by uh, the Alliance of Cities, it's, it's uh, a part of efficiency, it's also about trust to bring Europe closer to its citizens. And I think that the gap has unfortunately like rather widened in the past years and not uh, closed. And uh, I think us as dedicated pro-Europeans, uh, we really have to hold this as, as one of our guiding principles. Because let's face it, as of now, the EU is singularly ineffective in making itself visible. Sometimes I call it like a Batman style statecraft a force for good, but in disguise. Well, that's good for su superheroes, but quite bad for uh, authorities uh, that rely on the votes and the trust of, of its citizens. And Brussels currently has very few direct links to citizens and governments are very keen to play the gatekeeper and very often, unfortunately, taking credit for EU actions. And uh, even in the case when they do divert funds to their own pockets sometimes. It's very bad also under normal circumstances, but in crisis, this is a prime receipt for disaster. People on the ground need to see that they can rely on Europe. More direct links and much better so-called advertising would definitely help. And local governments can be very powerful allies who can amplify the voice of Europe. Because they are on the ground, they can use their platforms so that programs very promptly reach their destination. They can leverage their local networks to find every bottleneck that stands out between a hospital and medical equipment, every obstacle between a small business owner and an EU emergency loan. There are so many of them and they need to be brought down. And uh, when we respond to these concerns, I was very uh, happy to hear our uh, commissioner, uh, Vera Jourova, uh, who also highlighted the crucial role local governments play during crisis, she had a very good quote, uh, which says that when people are in trouble, the first case, they expect help from somebody who understands their difficult situation. And it is really the self-government and the municipality at the place they live in. So I, I was very happy to hear uh, these remarks from the commission. And I hope that your uh, commissioner will be a good ally for us in the coming months. And this is also exactly why many of us in Hungary are quite deeply worried that our current government, the Orban government, took away vital funds from municipal governments. Let me just give you one example, and this is also a good uh, um, explanation on why we also need this money from a democratic uh, uh, perspective. A town called Good, uh, with a mayor from my own party momentum, it saw two thirds of its revenues being taken away as an exceptional result of an emergency measure, and it will stay like that. And uh, now it seems that this exception will become the rule as the government submitted this proposal as a regular legislative act for the future. Well, I uh, can only quote once again Commissioner Jourova, who encouraged municipal governments who are stripped of their revenues to go to court against the Orban government. 
But I think we all know that justice delayed is justice denied, mostly in times like this. These local governments and also so many uh, others uh, due to different uh, reasonings all over Europe, these local governments now do not have the luxury of time. Means for these municipalities to get emergency funding is of really paramount importance. And the proposal on the table would ensure just that. And lastly, um, let me just talk a bit about something uh, that is, of course, very uh, heavily highlighted in Benedict's document uh, and that was also already addressed in detail by uh, Mr. Lambert and Mr. Karachoin. But I, let me just give my perspective on how the European Union's climate agenda, really the biggest challenge, I think, of our lifetime, how can it be furthered by direct funding to cities? And as the proposal very crucially highlights, cities are in the forefront of climate action. Direct EU investment in climate resilient infrastructure, for instance, uh, very actively needs local knowledge and expertise found in municipal governments. Uh, during uh, our work uh, on the EU Gre uh, Green Deal uh, and also other legislations uh, surrounding that, I am very constantly reminded how important local knowledge for an effective EU level uh, climate strategy is. Because let me just highlight just, just one problem our Budapest-based policy team raised my awareness to in a few days ago, the case of so-called urban heat islands and their unequal impact on the most vulnerable communities. Uh, this is the case where extreme heat can be amplified by the lack of resilient infrastructure. In turn, it causes cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, impacts the elderly, the poor, the homeless in cities. And the people who are hit hardest are those who have the fewest means to fight back. If climate change threatens the livelihoods and worsens health problems of people who are already vulnerable, escaping poverty becomes even more difficult. But in this field, targeted EU action through direct funds to cities could tackle this very multifaceted overlapping challenge by its very core. So I, I think that uh, this is really the uh, prime case where uh, we have to step up action. I just mentioned a couple of examples, and but there are so many- Sorry for inter examples. interrupting, but I, I think we Thank must you. come to the end of uh, your contribution um, because we are a little bit beyond the original time frame. Um, sorry for being strict with that. Uh, but we I have to add, good, thank you very much, uh, because we have two additional speakers, and uh, I wouldn't like to take the time away from them. First, uh, I would like to ask uh, Monika Vanna uh, from Austria, Green Group in the European Parliament, uh, and um, um, for a long time, um, an important um, fighter for um, a fair regional policy and cohesion policy in the EU uh, to, to um, give his uh, contribution to this discussion. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Benza. I'm so happy to be part of this great event today and thank you very much for organization and congratulations to the authors and initiatives initiators of this excellent policy paper uh, of, on direct funding of the cities. You know, um, I was a local councillor for 13 years in the city of uh, Vienna and I started cooperation, especially with Central and Eastern Europe and also with the Western Balkans 15 years ago with um, an event called Central European Roundtable. And it's so important to um, uh, to have this uh, cross-border cooperation and uh, this initiative of the V4 is especially important because it emerged in Central Europe where the struggle for rule of law and against corruption has been carried out primarily by progressive city administrations and now you gain so much support beyond uh, 22 cities are heard from 13 countries so congratulations for that and uh, this uh, policy paper is really a great step in the right direction because we, on the one hand, we have to fight on the European level, we talked already about it, for a very strong cohesion policy, including cities, together, for example, with platforms like the Cohesion Alliance. But it's really, uh, we really need to put a stronger focus on cities and urban areas in our polities, simply to make a positive impact for the majority of uh, the population of the European Union that has already been said by the mayor of Budapest and others. 
When we started our cooperation, Benzi, you know, on this direct funding for cities paper, we put primarily the focus on the climate crisis. It was before the so-called Corona crisis, and the focus was more the progressive role that cities can play in the fight against climate change. And of course, now the, the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis hugely impacted us all and changed the political scene completely. But I think uh, in your paper, you managed to make an even stronger case why we need to empower cities and municipalities, especially in this situation now, because tackling the climate crisis and achieving a just and fair and social transition will not be able without strong cities and without strong cities that can invest. And what I really like on this paper is that you make absolutely clear that there cannot be a green deal without social uh, justice, without the social transition um, uh, together. Uh, because we, we as Greens especially, we not only want jobs and growth, we want sustainable growth and we want decent jobs. And this is also a point you cover very clearly in your paper. But let us be honest, you know, all the problems we are discussing now from climate change to inequalities, social, they existed already before the corona crisis, of course. And uh, the corona crisis just made visible where the failures were in the past. For example, the consequences of austerity policy. Uh, 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 when you look at, at, at uh, the health systems uh, now in many countries and made uh, the failures of the past more visible. And I deeply think as a Green, we need reforms of the whole EU system. And so I'm, um, um, I'm hoping that the conference of the future uh, for the future of the EU can start soon and will, uh, of course, include cities and civil society for the discussion how the EU um, uh, should, uh, should be structured um, in, in, in the future. Uh, what I also really like on it, in your paper, and you presented it perfectly, Benze, is that it really gives a clear overview of the options we as politicians have. You make concrete amendments that's very helpful for us as MEPs and uh, uh, they can be readily implemented. We don't have much work with them. And, uh, it's, um, and, and, and I just say it because you know it already, but, but I think it's clear that we as Greens EFA group, we support all your proposals, uh, be it uh, the raising, uh, yeah, the raise of existing programs, or be it better and direct access for cities to funding, or be it new tools, of course. Um, uh, for example, all your proposals uh, you presented on the urban initiative, sustainable urban development, very, very important. Uh, Commissioner Hahn from Austria invented it uh, in former times. We were very happy for this so-called urban dimension and we really have uh, to, to, to see now that it doesn't uh, fade away <laughs> uh, um, uh, with the new plans coming up. So this is the, uh, sustainable urban development the dimension in the ERDF is very important. And also, of course, Horizon Europe and uh, uh, connection, uh, 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 connecting Europe facilities. But let me just mention two of your topics separately very quickly because I think they are really at stake now. The Green Deal and the Just Transition Fund and the recovery plan. Of course, we Greens support all your proposals very much to include cities more strongly in the Just Transition Fund in general, and in particular, including easier access to resources of the second and third pillar on the GTF, as well as the demand to provide sufficient funds for city level climate efforts. But let me, uh, let me say very clear, uh, I, th I think Philippe and also others mentioned it already, um, it's absolutely clear for us Greens that we must not lower the EU's ambition when it comes to crime uh, uh, to, the, uh, 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 to the Green Deal now, because the fight against climate change and the social and economic recovery is not a contradiction. On the contrary, investments in climate protection and a just and social transition of our economies is the best stimulus to overcome the crisis, of course. And uh, on the recovery fund, you know, the, um, uh, the Greens, of course, welcome very much the huge ambition, especially in the architecture of the recovery fund. Uh, uh, Philippe mentioned that already. But you know, as always, the devil is in the detail. And uh, if, if, you, if you look at the title, Next, Next Generation Fund, we don't think that the proposal that are now on the table really fulfill this, this challenge. We, we really lack a concrete and mandatory uh, ambition in climate, uh, find it uh, in, the, in, in the recovery plan. We need a social dimension beyond health. You mentioned, Benze, and also other mentioned the uh, immense, um, immense importance of public services. 
uh, and we Greens uh, think that uh, beneath a, a Green Deal, we urgently need a Care Deal because it's also women that are mostly affected by the crisis. And maybe you've heard that some of uh, uh, some MEPs have launched an, an initiative in the European Parliament called Half of It half of the money of the recovery fund for women because uh, this crisis really has a gender dimension. And of course, the involvement of the cities at the local level, this is really lacking when we talk about where the money should go to and who, who would be involved to decide uh, who should get the money. And one point that is very, uh, very important for us Greens is that we are unfortunately, also with the, with, the, um, uh, with the plans of the recovery plan, still far away from the social union we want as counterpart to the European and monetary union, for example, with Europe-wide social standards like minimum, in, minimum income or an uh, employment in, insurance. Uh, why do I mention this? Because for all these challenges ahead, we don't need only strong cooperation between European level and the cities, we need strong cities. Uh, you mentioned it, Bense, I think in your presentation, uh, what, what, what I loved uh, being a cities politician, local politician, was always that I had the feeling cities can move faster than the national governments. They are, they are much closer to their inhabitants. They are, um, are more responsive to new ideas and often more progressive and innovative. This is the big advantage. And we need strong cities in the next years to commit to ambitious climate and energy policies, to energy efficiency in housing and construction, Sustainable, uh, sustainable urban mobility for public services. And we need, and this is my last so, point. So, so, yeah, okay, sorry again, I but I must remind you no. the time constraint. This is my absolutely last point. We need strong cities to be reliable and efficient partners in situations where we cannot trust member states to manage EU funds accordingly to the rule of law standards. So we urgently need a serious rule of law mechanism. Uh, maybe we can uh, debate that a little bit later, but uh, thank you for your attention in this stage. Thank you so much, Monia, for uh, those very valuable uh, ideas and contribution to this discussion. And uh, not to waste uh, time, I, I directly pass the floor to my good colleague and, and uh, friend, um, Istvan Wihei, um, from the SND, uh, the Socialists and Democrats uh, group in the European Parliament and the Hungarian Socialist Party to uh, give his uh, contribution to the discussion. Istvan, the floor is absolutely yours. Absolutely mine. Thank you so much, uh, Benedek, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear mayors, dear members of the European Parliament, representatives of the Committee of the Region and uh, our good uh, social partners. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, very kind uh, to be here and uh, I'm honored uh, to be here to speak about this very important and extraordinary topic. Uh, and I try to cut out some uh, pages of my speech, uh, uh, but I would like to tell you some important uh, messages uh, from the SND group in the Parliament, the European Parliament. And of course, as uh, Vice Chair of the Transportation and Tourism Committee, uh, because all my issues are very close to the cities uh, and uh, the future. Um, it's hard to describe how dramatically our life has changed in a relatively short period of time. Those expressions and references which have been among the most frequently used ones in the European political landscape, such as the European Green Deal, European Pillar of Social Rights or Digital Strategy, have been reply, replaced by personal protective equipment, ventilators and tests it has become evident that the European Union, Union has entered uh, the deepest economic uh, recession in its history. The overall economic is expected to contract by a record 7.4% this, uh, this year. Consequently, millions of Europeans have already lost or will lose their jobs and countless people and families then find themselves in a hopeless situation. And uh, as the old saying goes, every challenge is an opportunity. The current economic crisis has raised a great number of existential questions. Do we want to rebuild what we had before? Or do we say the opportunity to create a new and different socio-economic model and new jobs that can serve us for decades to come? 
I personally share the opinion of those who say that the future is a green, resilient, and digital economy that ensures jobs and economic growth in a sustainable way. The updated and uh, reshaped next MFF and the new recovery instrument, the so-called next generation EU, are below the European Parliament's initial position, but it must be considered as an ambitious and positive step in the right direction. There are still a great number of open questions, such as the reform of the own resources, the rule of law conditionality, and the exact way of distribution of the EU funds. However, in accordance with the European citizens' expectations, the entire proposed package must reflect highly the financial and social economic need of the green and digital transformation. The current crisis, the ongoing negotiations on the MFF and on the recovery instrument, furthermore, the approaching conference of the future of Europe create a historic opportunity and the real moment for the cities and also for the local governments. There are countless reasons why the cities should be involved more intensively and should be able to benefit from an increased number of direct EU funds. However, uh, let me focus on only two specific ones. One is rooted from the lessons of the past and the other is future-oriented reason that could guarantee a sustainable future. Let me begin with a crystal clear lesson and take away from the past. Given the fact that we have seen from the first line corruption scandals, emerging loyal oligarchs, misuse of EU funds during the last years, now we have reached the point when there is a clear political will in the vast, vast majority of member states backed by the European Commission and the European Parliament to protect the Union's budget in case of generalized deficiencies and as regards the rule of law in the member states by introducing conditionality. The European Parliament, uh, and uh, I think your colleagues, you re remember it, it was last January, last year in January, in its report complemented the uh, European Commission's proposal by adding an outstandingly important element, which is the protection of the final beneficiaries due to the fact that no European citizen company or city can be punished for the decisions of the given member states' governments. In this context, the cities and the local governments could play a more decisive role than ever. Uh, the example what happened in Hungary, uh, Kata mentioned, uh, I don't want to tell more about that, uh, what happened the, uh, uh, with the EU funds the last uh, years. Uh, um, but uh, it is uh, uh, especially problematic uh, and unacceptable acceptable in those member states where the government and the governmental authorities use the distribution of such a funds as a political tool by providing significantly more opportunity for those municipalities which are led by government-friendly people and punishing municipalities which are in opposition. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, the last uh, years uh, I tried to organize several meetings with the Hungarian mayors, with uh, members or commissioners uh, in the commission. Uh, we met with uh, uh, Ferreira, uh, we met with Timmermans, we met, uh, we met with uh, Schmidt, uh, we met with Valean, uh, and uh, all these topics are very important. The housing, uh, uh, the Green Deal, uh, the, the funds. Uh, or the uh, transportation or the tourism. And that's why I would like to tell you, we will push the lobby. We will push this idea of what uh, Benedek uh, and the mayor of Budapest, Gergely, uh, started to propose here. Secondly, and this is the last one, the future-oriented reason is more than evident. Countless examples from recent years have shown that local governments can take the lead in the green and digital transition and implement ambitious action plans to build up a digital resilient and sustainable future. I truly believe that cities uh, will be the engine of the European Green Deal and the green transition and I hope that both the member states and the EU will recognize their role and will count on the cities and local governments. 
and colleagues, uh, I would like to mention uh, only one more project, but uh, I need uh, where I need your 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 partnership uh, in the social democratic family. We started uh, to push the European Health Union uh, idea, and uh, it's also very important uh, to give direct funds for to, to the cities uh, to to make better uh, health. Uh, service uh, in the in the local for the local citizens. Uh, uh, that's why I would like to ask Benedek you uh, to 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 take part of this project because uh, the European Health Union I think is will be very very important uh, for all the citizens in the future. So colleagues, thank you so much uh, from the SND group. I will be next to you. Uh, let me close my remark with a personal note. Uh, I was member of uh, the local government of city of, of my city, Seged. Uh, it was about uh, 20 years ago, uh, and I know very well what does it mean uh, to work uh, for the people uh, on the local level. Uh, it is uh, very important. That's why we have to give more, found more uh, support from the European level to the cities. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for, for the contribution. And uh, as we are a little bit beyond the original time frame, um, I um, would pass the floor soon to uh, the mayor of Prague, who I welcome very warmly to our meeting, uh, Zdenek Zib, uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, three very short questions, um, and one of uh, that is about the the basic income concept and how this could be included uh, into this initiative. I think that perhaps you can come back to this issue at the end of the, uh, this webinar. We might have a little bit more time to discuss this. Um, and two technical questions. One, if it's possible to get the, the PPT, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, of course, uh, we will send it by email for all the registered participants of the, the webinar. The second, that what are the conditions for a city to be connected to the network uh, we created? It's not an official network, so there are no conditions. Just contact uh, the city of Budapest or, or myself, the representation of the city of Budapest in Brussels. Um, and uh, so there are no uh, official conditions to, to join. Uh, you can be part of it. We are happy to, to invite everyone. But now we turn to the second panel uh, to this webinar, which will be opened uh, by the mayor of Prague, Zdenek Zib. I'm really happy to have him uh, with us. And I would like to give the floor uh, to Zdenek. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to all of you from Prague. Good morning, good late morning to you all. Well, cities play an important role in the contemporary world. Uh, furthermore, I believe that the cities will be even more important and influential in the near future. And our good friend and colleague Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, rightly said that the 19th century was the age of empires, the 20th century was the age of national states and the 21st century is the age of cities. Mayors can achieve what national states could not simply afford. And moreover, intensive cooperation between cities across the national borders contribute to the process of further and deeper cooperation between nations around the world. Even nations that do not have close relations on the government-to-government -government level can easily work on a mutually beneficial projects on a city-to-city -city level. In case of we four countries, an interesting opportunity presented itself not such a long time ago. Uh, people in all four countries elected mayors of their respected capital cities who are rather progressive, pro-democratic and adherent to liberal principles. Those similarities brought us closer together at the end of last year and we have signed the Pact of Free Cities in Budapest. 
little did we know uh, what was about to happen this year, however. The mayors stand at the forefront of the climate crisis as well as the coronavirus crisis. Our primary target is to secure safety of all people in our cities and in order to do our job properly, we need to have adequate resources. But we do not have them now because unfortunately our government was not able to give us a hand. And worse still, our government decided to cut off our financial resources and use the money to fix the problems they caused by their economy restrictions instead. And that was a truly black day for the mayors across our country. And in the end, our government decided to suddenly change its mind and give local municipal authorities certain additional financial aid. Even though it may seem as the desired result, mayors really need a reliable partner to work with in the long run. And therefore, we turn to the EU for help. We need direct European funding for cities in order to be able to deal with the great challenges ahead of us. Uh, and I am quite sure that the EU can assist us where our national governments regrettably fail to do so. Well, the good news is that we are not alone in our struggle. More than 30 mayors of other European cities joined our initiative as well. And together we present a political force that should be noticed all over the entire continent and bring about the change we want to see. Thank you very much, all of you, for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, for uh, your keynote speech uh, at the beginning of this uh, panel. And um, as it was mentioned that um, Norman Spopens, uh, Deputy Director General of DG Regio, um, might be a bit late um, as uh, he is at an other meeting. Uh, uh, and I think that he was not able to join us yet. I would give the floor the next speaker and uh, Mr. Poppins can um, come uh, to the screen when uh, he joins us. So I would like to ask um, Mr. Bernd Voss from the city of Kiel in Germany uh, and uh, who is uh, uh, the co-chair of the Greens uh, group in the committee of the regions, uh, which we believe um, one of our crucial partner um, in um, advocating the city's interest in the European decision-making uh, to give his uh, contribution um, to this uh, webinar. Uh, so, Bernd, uh, the floor is yours. I hope that you are around and um, we are waiting for your uh, insights. Yeah, um, dear Benedict, thank you very much. I am the regional assistant of Bernd Forst, as you can see. He's also still in a, an appointment and oh. I'd like to excuse, excuse him. Okay, so also he will be back later. Then there is a simple solution to move ahead uh, with the program because we, uh, I hope that we have uh, Annalisa Boni. Um, who joined us a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah, hi Annalisa. Good I'm to here, see can you hear me? Absolutely, clearly. Annalisa Boni uh, is uh, the chair of uh, the Brussels uh, unit or secretary general of the Brussels unit of uh, Eurocities. Eurocities, as you may know, uh, is the, perhaps the strongest city alliance in, in Europe and a very important partner for us uh, to uh, advocate citizens' interest. Also, they were involved um, in the discussions uh, how to prepare this paper. So I'm really very happy to have Annalisa with us. And then I give you the, uh, the floor to, to give your uh, remarks, insights, views on the question. Annalisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Benedek. Uh, I'm very happy. Good morning, everyone. I can see uh, some of the my mayors, uh, like the mayor of Prague, the mayor of Budapest, Kiel is also a member. So it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to, to see how cities are also acting uh, to ask the same thing that we do. <laughs> we have been asking uh, for so long uh, and for 
actually for the last few decades, if, I'm, uh, if I can say that. Sometimes uh, it's a bit frustrating. I feel like a disc, you know, because I've been working with local and regional authorities and European affairs for the over 25 years now. And I've been repeating the same thing so, so many times in many contexts. But I have to say that the context of this morning, uh, where there are so many MEPs, there are also friends, Monica and many others. I mean, Jan, I don't know if he was there at the beginning, but anyway, in the European Parliament, I have to say we have quite a few friends. We've had, we have been having, uh, of course, Jan uh, Ulrich is a long standing one because of his role as a in the RDF for a couple of programming periods. Uh, but yeah, so you know, it's, a, it's a positive uh, environment, I have to say. And also, uh, Normund, who is not there yet, is a super friend in the G-Radio of, of, uh, of cities, so that's really easy. It's a nice environment. So, um, I, won't, I will not tell you again why cities should benefit more and better from EU funding, because it's been so well and very well covered by all the previous speakers, by the paper that you have put together, uh, Benedek, it's, it's great, uh, and all the letters that have been going to to the different European institutions. And now with COVID, uh, you know, it's even clear in a way, uh, because it's, a, it's like, it, it's, as Monica said, cities have been the hardest hit by the crisis, but it's also, uh, it's where the crisis has exposed the, problem, the problems and the, the gaps and the issues that were there anyway before, uh, like poverty and discrimination and so on, but also and above all, where the climate crisis is really strong. Yeah, think of all the millions of people dying from a bad air quality. So that's just uh, so the reasons we don't have to go back uh, on the on the why more and better funding should reach cities. That's crystal clear. Now, one thing I would like to say is that we should never forget where we come from because we come from far, in the sense that we've seen the urban dimension in EU policy and EU funding increase. Yeah, in the last couple of decades, it has increased. There is no way about it. We have seen it in cohesion policy. Monica mentioned Han uh, in already 2007. From there onwards, 5% of your marking for you know, uh, strategies, urban strategies, was already an innovation, the innovative actions, uh, more mainstream money in operational programs. If you ask the Commission, they will come with the billions and billions that end up in C. So on this period, fine, we can count on 6%. We've asked for 10% also, uh, thanks to the Parliament, but I don't think the European Commission thinks that this is possible and it's uh, worth fighting with the member states about. The money for innovative action could definitely be more because you know, the cities are using it so uh, much and benefiting so much from it. It's a very good uh, model uh, for EU funding. But there again, it's not considered worth because what's 500,000? What is this? So it's really not enough. But okay, again, we come from far because other programs in the last two years have recognized the importance of cities and I'm thinking of the framework program at age 2020 on its own with you know, many DGs behind that have reinforced, have, have reinforced the, the urban dimension. I'm thinking of DG environment, DG move, DG home. They're all good examples with whom you know, we are working to, to help. But if we want to uh, improve and go even further, especially now that the crisis uh, that is uh, you know, ahead of us is gonna be so big, uh, for me, the main barriers I see today are mainly two. One, it's the one that, again, I've repeated many times. If the EU doesn't have an ambitious and coordinated approach to urban, in its overall political strategy, it will not really fly. At the moment, I don't think that the Commission, for instance, uh, doesn't see the role of cities as a crucial enough, politically high enough element for delivering its key priorities on the ground and to make you know, the European Union meaningful for European citizens. It's not, I don't think it's recognized enough. We, they see cities as one of the many actors, uh, it has heavily increased the possibilities for cities to benefit from EU funding, all you want, uh, you know, all these kind of things. But 
It's done it without a clear political strategy, ambitious strategy, coordinated political ambition. You see what I mean? It's always like saying urban is national, leave it there. Uh, the commission can do whatever they can in their remit, like a one-stop shop that the DG Ranger has very kindly established or the urban agenda effort, which has tried to improve the governance and put cities at the table. But still actions and funding therefore towards cities remain fragmented. And that's why we've been asking many times to have, you know, a sort of high level element of the team of the European Commission, like a vice president or something that would have the urban portfolio in their remit, because that would uh, increase the sort of ambition, if you see what I mean, and therefore the uh, coordination. And it's not only about cohesion policy. Today, it, it is very much related. And I have to say, as I said before, Poppins is fantastic and DG Radio have done all they could to really reinforce the urban dimension. So the first one is really that for me. If we don't change that, and the urban agenda was like something that gave some hope. We had in, DG, in, a, in the Regi Committee some uh, members of the European Parliament that helped pushing that. But yeah, today for me, that's kind of lucky. The second element is the member states, and this we know. So EU funding needs to be channeled where it is most needed. Now, in the, if you look at the recovery and resilience facility, it's all directed to member states. So what we want to improve is this principle of partnership and multi-level governance in the whole regulatory framework. This is lacking. If we don't change that, nothing will change. You know, if we don't have a local dimension in the European semester process that is able to assess the urban needs and the local investment gaps, you know, nothing will arrive, that, nothing that is really meaningful for cities will arrive at the local level. You know, so it's really about this sort of governance again and the reference for in, in involving cities in the processes, in the European semester, in the, you know, in the in the application of uh, in the sorry in the implementation of the uh, recovery and resilience facility for instance uh, in the national recovery and resilience plans therefore there needs to be a very strong rep and uh, yeah so it's really important because if we don't do that even the deployment will be slower and will not have an impact at the local level that's really it's it's really most urgent even more urgent now than before uh, so if you look uh, at, this is the more general, so it's, it's really like the principle of partnership. Then if you look at more specifically the cohesion, you know, package, which is fantastic because it's been increased and so on. I think that's very, that's very much to welcome, but we need to make sure that the, you know, the, the urban element can be as strong as, 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 as possible. Yeah, that's not guaranteed. And that will depend on, again at the national level and the management and the managing authority level. The Commission will tell you we can't do anything about that. So, for instance, uh, they have uh, the Commission has proposed a more flexible approach to the thematic concentration on the policy objectives. I don't know if you if you've seen that, which will help, for instance, uh, you know, to help the tourist sector, the cultural sector, which is very good. But this should not jeopardize you know the earmarked funding for urban areas so we need to make sure that we still have minimum six if not any even possible ten percent so we have to make sure that that uh, stays uh, very much um yeah i don't want to take too much uh, too much time so it's really these two elements it's about having a, an ambitious uh, approach by the commission and um you know tackling the member state level, which is, I think, the bigger the bigger barrier. Now, the, you mentioned the mission uh, on climate uh, neutral cities, so establishing uh, uh, 100, uh, 100 cities that are climate neutral by 2030. I'm not talking about cities uh, as such, but maybe districts, because that's easier for 2030. Since 2030 is tomorrow, it would be very complicated to, to have uh, uh, a city like uh, Budapest or Vienna uh, go climate neutral by 2030, <laughs> it's impossible. 
but uh, the mission is uh, an opportunity again to have a, uh, an integrated vision by the EU and therefore if you have an integrated vision you have also a, a, a strategic how do you say a, a, a mirroring in the funding and so that's why we propose if a city needs to be transformed you know in a systemic way to achieve climate neutrality then it will need all the different funding and all the different possibilities that the EU, the national, the private, the local can offer to help uh, achieve climate neutrality. So it's really for me having this double uh, element of uh, integrated vision on urban, because if, you, if we just go on with sectorial approaches, it will make it even more complicated. Uh, and the, so how can we tackle the national level to make sure that now in this new phase of the recovery plans, the, the partnership principle and the involvement of local authority can be better recognized. Because I think at the end of the day, uh, if we get it right in cities, like Han had said, I really always uh, like to quote uh, Commissioner Han, if we get it right in cities, we will get it right for, the, for Europe. So it's really about trying to convince everyone that that's the case. But okay, there is so much complexity in terms of political differences, uh, bureaucracy, and so on. So it's a, it's a very, it is a mission in itself. Uh, but I mean, we will never stop uh, believing it. We will never stop fighting for it. So whatever ally we can get from all the, you know, all the corners of the EU institutions. Uh, and I know that in the parliament, we have a lot of friends but also in the European Commission. But I find that the Council is the most uh, difficult. So, yeah, I, I hope I, I've not been too long. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Annalisa, for uh, these um, ideas and insights. I think it's very important. And uh, we have uh, Ben Foss uh, with us. Um, he's back from the other event. Uh, he partic he's participating in parallel. So um, I give the floor to, to Ben to give us an insights from the perspective of the Committee of the Regions. Ben, it's you now. <clears throat> Thank you, Benedict. Thank you, Mr. Karashoni. Uh, thank you for the network. Congratulations on the work you did. Yes, I'm a member of Parliament in Schleswig-Holstein, the northern country of Germany. And like all members of the core, me too, as a, as a co-president, we have double job, double life in our parliaments at home. And that was just the situation. But my um, assistant and I, we followed the session. The COVID-19 crisis has put a hard challenge on us. Many inhabitants and leaders in the cities and the regions are still affected by the economic and social consequences of this crisis, you know it. In the COVID, in the COVID cities and regions have been in the front line in this crisis. And so, so will it be with the climate change. The climate change to be discussed as a crisis that will come since a long time. And so it will be, and cities and region will feel the effect of drug, of fireness, civil level rise. I come near the nearest, uh, deepest point of Germany, that's my dairy farm, and uh, heavy rain events we know too, more and more. Cities and regions are essential when it comes to um, to mitigate to emissions and to temperature curve. They provide areas for windmills, typhoon, photovoltaic, solar terminal panels. They are providing and financing tenders for sustainable public transports, new heating system and sustainable buildings will shape their, their appearance. I think I see it all in my region and I see it in the big town in my near in Hamburg, especially in rural areas, pioneers run citizen-owned wind solar parks. They share the revenues from the sale of renewable energies and help to fund published infrastructure from these income. Often those regions also pioneer in the processing of renewable sources to direct electric mobility, 
production of green hydrogen and use of and use um, of excess heat as feedstock in zero emission heat grids. Cities and regions are key to a net zero circular economy. For COVID, we mainly succeeded to bend the curve of new infections, which has saved millions of lives. To reach success in climate change, time is very, very short. In only eight years business as usual, we should have hit the budget for 1.50 degrees warming all over the world, which puts not only coral reefs, polar bears, but whole states and international security at server risk and bring us close to dangerous ecological typing points. So we must leave the current track toward towards 3.32 degrees warming until 2100 as possible, as, it's, uh, as fast as possible. The MFF and current recovery plans must help cities and regions to take strong, wild action. Direct funding for green investment, stimulation, rural city development would not only bring job resilience and value added to cities and regions. Direct funding for LRA would bring urgently needed acceleration to climate solutions. Regarding the, late, the latest communication of the EC towards the roadmap of green hydrogen, I would like to underline the rule of decentralized applica um, applications. You know, we all often speak only about big industrial com uh, complex in that way. Decentralized renewable energy production will Electrolysis bring an uh, opportunity to use excess heat for heating the houses, for electrolysis and save fuels, and for all the heating sectors. It's very, very important to have renewable energy. That's a big, big area we have to work on, not only electricity and uh, mobilize. And there I see um, that we have to have a look what's possible. Uh, for small cities, for big cities, and for regions to use um, uh, all, all the things uh, we have and not to put so much heat into the atmosphere. In my region, Schleswig-Holstein, it happens. All the things happen, but it's like uh, in the region with coal, who runs uh, very early in a new thing. It's in a problematic positions like regions who are very, very, uh, very, very in the backyard like a coal region. So renewable energies can be used locally in the three sectors, electricity, mobility, and heating. And I think that's a very important point for the cities because there we can use it very, very effectively. When it comes to the implementation, we should not relieve the member states from their responsibility. In other hand, direct programs between EU and LAR would help to simplify and accelerate the implementation. When I see two points in my region, we have a program, we try a program um, with stations for electric cars. We're waiting more than one year that we can work with this because it's a long way uh, until it works. Uh, there are so many levels, a direct level should be much quicker. And another thing, we have an ITI uh, program, we take part in ITI program, it's a part of, uh, of uh, EFRE for sustainable tourism and uh, it, it nearly doesn't work. We have a lot of uh, people who work there from the local, from the cities, and, and try to have good ideas and present good ideas, but it's too far away and there are too, too much levels between, and uh, that stops it and makes uh, people tired of, uh, of uh, working for change, and working for change and waiting so long uh, for the good projects. In our view, it would be good if 10% or more of the uh, EFREA funds would be provide a direct access to the LRA. I think that's not too much. I think that's important. Um, that's an important part that the cities, that the regions 
can work and 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 can work official in their situation they have so uh, so far at home and they know uh, how to be carbon free best when they can work on their position so fully support your paper in particular the experts proposal for the horizon program uh, to fund 100 cities going climate neutral neutral until 2070 highlights the importance of local actions and necessary um, and the necessary of enable pioneers i think that's very very important and we we are very much in favor for a direct funding during the new facility in mff with own budgets uh, for net zero in investigations i think um, that's very important that we have a look to it. Direct funding for pioneer cities and regions moving towards a net zero economy uh, with the right tool of make change happen. And when I uh, see the first words of Mr. Lambert, yes, we were very happy and uh, fully support the Green Deal strategy of the, um, for economic growth and new jobs value added. Uh, across the region and we were very happy when papers from the commission came last like week about uh, farm to fork strategy it's only a strategy up to now and uh, biodiverse to only call two it shows that the commission seems to be uh, very consequent very consequent in their way and uh, that makes me hopeful but it's not a way that went by by it alone and when i see it um, uh, with the program for the next generation we are speaking about, uh, then we must be clear, not the next generation will have to do the work, our generation, we have to do the work now, and that's important, and in that way it's very important for the success of Europe that we have direct funds, uh, direct strong funds, direct for cities and regions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben, for your contribution. I think that the Committee of the Region perspective is, is really important for us. But also there is a very important um, perspective, and uh, that is the incoming German presidency, uh, as uh, most probably the final words about uh, the next MFF uh, will be told during the period of the German presidency. So I'm extremely happy to welcome Katharina Erdmenger from uh, the permanent representation of the Federal Republic of Germany, who um, I would like to ask to give his um, presentation or insights or views on um, city funding in the next MFF. Erdmenger, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, Thank you very much for, for the uh, invitation to participate in this um, really interesting um, discussion. Um, it's a privilege to be, to, be, to be following this. And um, well, let me um, give you some insights in, in what the German presidency um, wants to do. Perhaps more generally in terms of um, urban policies as such, um, not so much maybe about the MFF itself, because I'm more on the, um, well, I'm here from the Ministry of the Interior, which now deals with uh, urban policies, so um, I'm not really the person who would be the one uh, in, in dealing with the uh, MFF negotiations in um, all the details. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, let me give you some, some insights on what we plan to do um, for the urban dimension and urban policies um, during, during our presidency. Um, let me start with one more, more general remark. Um, it feels even a bit difficult to be the first one to take the floor as a representative of a national government here. Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I hear all the, the calls um, you're issuing and all the pleas you're, you're issuing. Uh, just let me say, as a, maybe as an introductory remark, uh, you know, I'm from, I'm from Germany and um, even we on the national level, um, you know, there's only so much we can really do about urban development policies. Uh, I think, as you all know, and um, uh, as in, in, you know from your city networks, um, we have, of course, a very strong historic tradition of having very strong cities, uh, but then we also have very strong regions. Um, so, of course, there's only so much the, uh, the national government can, can really do. Um, but nevertheless, we, we have some plans. 
And um, so to, to give a more personal note, uh, uh, my family is actually originally from, from Hamburg. So I certainly know what a proud Hanseatic city, what a strong tradition of self-government is. Um, and then I appreciate all the calls also to say that it was a bit of a preliminary remark um, for direct funding um, for the cities. But um, now I'm going to give you a very bureaucratic argument. I know it's not political at all, but that's simply the realities of funding. Um, which somewhere you simply always have to take into account. I mean, the money goes, in, in a German case, not even to the national government, but to the regional governments. Um, that's the case for the ERDF. Um, and in the end, they're the ones who will have to provide all the evidence to the Commission what the money has been spent on. Uh, and they're the ones who are going to be liable if anything goes wrong. So that's the, the fear which, you know, you sometimes may feel in your discussions with, with regional or national governments may simply originate in that sort of procedure. Now, I appreciate that this is not really a political argument, but it's um, just that you know why administrations are sometimes so reluctant, just bear that in mind. I'm only saying that as the, to explain the realities, but the other thing, of course, about that is how can we, I mean, that's not um, an argument to say that can never change. I mean, there's um, certainly room for discussing how you can improve that, that kind of system. Um, nevertheless, um, as a, again, a rather general remark um, from the German national perspective, um, as I hope you know, when you've been talking to colleagues from Germany, um, we've always been very supportive, of course, of the urban dimension, um, not only in the regional funding. Um, we've also thought this is, of course, a very important dimension. Um, and uh, there's never been any doubt, you know, that the, the German government uh, in, in the MFF negotiations will definitely advocate the, um, uh, the strengthening of the, of the urban dimensions. Uh, and um, there's always been a certain percentage, of course, in ERDF, um, where we were always supporting to have it. And um, by the way, the funding reality always was that uh, Germany was always going beyond that percentage. So we were even spending more on the urban dimension than we would have had to do under the, the regulations. So that's certainly something which is definitely close to our hearts and uh, which we can always engage on. Um, the other thing I just wanted to give you a few insights on is um, that, of course, um, we will also do the more, not only the funding side of it, but the more political dimension of it. Um, and the sort of more um, general political um, debate on, on urban policies. Uh, and I suppose you all know that we're working very hard on actually rewriting uh, the Leipzig Charter um, and, uh, and the urban agenda. So there will actually be a renewed Leipzig Charter at the end of our presidency. Um, as you probably know, the Leipzig Charter is a, a set of principles on urban development. Uh, which has been adopted in 2007 uh, under the German presidency at, uh, presidency at that time. And at that time, the um, meeting took place in Leipzig. Uh, and then that's why it's called the Leipzig Charter. And we're still planning actually to have another meeting of the ministers responsible um, for urban policies uh, at the very end of November, very beginning of December, again in Leipzig to adopt this new um, Leipzig Charter. Fingers crossed it can be a physical meeting, we don't really know yet, but we're hoping to, to have that as a physical meeting in Leipzig again uh, to approve uh, this renewed Leipzig Charter, which is of course very much linked to uh, the further development of the, of the urban um, agenda. Uh, and um, we've actually based the rewriting of this uh, Leipzig Charter um, on three big principles which we need to respect. Uh, we've actually, the analysis we've made of the, the um, current version of the Leipzig Charter, the 2007 version, was that it didn't properly reflect three dimensions of where society is going. And one of that is climate change. Um, the next one is um, digitalization. Um, and um, a very important one is um, developing the integrated approach. Um, so we've definitely felt that what we did in 2007 was really good as a first step uh, of agreeing on principles for the sustainable European city, but we haven't gone far enough um, in the uh, dimensions of climate change and digitalization. So the new text is definitely going to, to um, reflect that um, very much, and especially uh, we're going to talk about how to implement the social development goals. Um, so. There you can see we definitely have a commitment of saying we, we want to go further um, 
in these principles of uh, of urban development and really reflect the idea of climate change in the in the new um, Leipzig Charter. Um, and the text is going to circle around three dimensions um, of of city development. It's going to be just city, it's going to be green city, and it's going to be the productive city. Um, and I think you can see from this that we're really trying to go further in this idea of a sustainable development of cities uh, and of an integrated approach. Um, that's something which we really always try to, to emphasize very much to say, um, a city is, an, is a living urbanism, uh, is, is a living organism. And um, what you need in there is really the interaction between all the actors involved, with um, all the stakeholders involved. Uh, and of course, you need to think cross-cutting and to see this city as a living organism. And um, we strongly believe that the current crisis has shown, shown so dramatically how sit important cities are as a living space for the citizens. I mean, if you even can't leave a city, uh, it becomes more and more important to have all kinds of services, of course, also in the digital um, uh, dimension, uh, to have access to infrastructure uh, and to simply have cities where you can breathe. Uh, so of course the green spaces um, have played an essential role at the moment. Um, so that's where we're really heading to say, you know, we need this, this, this integrated approach uh, and this idea of, of, of making the um, city um, an attractive place to, um, to live at. Um, but then also um, to say um, this kind of spatial approach and say the place-based approach and say, uh, what is it a city needs? Uh, also depends very much on the surrounding areas of the cities. And that's also one dimension we also want to um, develop a bit further. That's this idea of saying a city is an organism, but it's also connected to the territories around it. Um, so we also strongly always work on this idea of urban-rural relationships and saying you, if you're in a city, um, you're of course in interaction um, with the areas around you. And a lot can be done by way of um, sustainable development, of course, if you... Um, benefit from this interaction uh, with your surrounding areas. I mean, we're really talking about by sort of bi-local um, initiatives here, but again, in the current crisis, I think they've just um, been um, proof for how important it is um, to think this um, city development in connection with the um, surrounding rural areas. So um, that's the general ideas we, we're going to um, develop in the in the new Arctic Charter. And then, of course, I mean, we're going to say a bit about um, how to uh, go on with the urban agenda and to develop the, uh, the urban agenda. We're definitely committed to, to pursuing the, the idea of the um, urban agenda, uh, thinking about uh, strengthening the partnerships, um, especially the thematic um, partnerships there. Um, of course, they will always have to involve all layers of government, the cities themselves, and, but also the intermediate areas, the regional governments and national governments and the commission. Um, we are trying to think about how to improve the governance of, um, for the urban agenda. Um, maybe that's not yet decided, but um, there are talks about having a permanent secretariat uh, for the urban agenda. Um, there are also talks about having maybe national contact points. Um, and one of the tasks of these contact points actually would be to be able to advise on uh, funding possibilities. Um, of course, the information of how you have access to funding is very, very important for cities. And um, so these are, I mean, it's not all decided yet. Um, but these are ideas we will be developing um, as we go along and um, finalize the text of the Leipzig Charter and then um, talk about how to put it in practice um, by way of the, of the urban um, agenda. Um, so that's, that's where we want to go uh, to make it easier for cities to, to access the various forms um, of, of funding. I particularly like, Benning, what you were saying in your um, presentation about um, if you want to access funding, it's not only about the urban dimension in the ERDF. Um, there are a lot of programs around uh, where you can actually, as a city, uh, apply. Uh, and I really like the approach of saying there's a lot of money around, and especially, of course, with the new MFF, there will be and the, um, um, the recovery um, uh, funds. Um, there will be a lot of money around, and it's essential as a city to, to be aware of that and to, to see where you can actually um, find sources. Um, and um, I particularly like actually that you were mentioning the uh, Connecting Europe facility. I, you, you, as a city, maybe you wouldn't think about that um, uh, uh, as a first uh, possibility for funding, but um, if you actually think that as a city, you are somewhere on a big European corridor, 
um, and you're part of these big European connections, um, then that's also a dimension of the city. Uh, and then actually um, asking for money from the Connecting Europe facility might actually be a good idea for your infrastructure. Um, and then again, improving the infrastructure might also be beneficial again for um, your CO2 emissions in, a, in your city. So I really like that approach of saying um, there's a lot of possibilities around for cities and it's actually very important to be informed about them. Um, right, I think I'll um, leave it at that for now with a view to the time. But um, thanks again for um, being able to um, participate in this um, discussion. And um, if you remember that, you know, as a German national government, we're definitely trying to do something about this urban dimension during our presidency uh, under the um, somewhat um, more difficult circumstances, then, then, then I'm happy about that. Thank you. Thank you so much um, uh, for this very interesting uh, contribution. And I'm really happy that you mentioned also the Leipzig Charter, because I think that it's, it's an important and we have a question regarding the Leipzig Charter and we, we are aware of the fact that uh, the German presidency uh, has um, um, as a project renewal the Leipzig Charter. It's an important thing for us. Uh, but now, um, last but at all not least, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Potens, uh, uh, Deputy Director General of DG Regio. Uh, to give us an uh, introduction on how the uh, DG Regio and the European Commission uh, has a look on um, urban uh, funding, cities, um, access to, to European funding in the next MFF. Where are you at the thinking of, um, of those issues uh, in, um, and uh, how do you prepare yourself for the coming discussions with uh, the legislators? Mr. Poppins, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for having me, and thank you for being patient. Uh, the reason for my delay is exactly that. We are very actively engaged, as you can imagine, in the DG region, or in the Commission, but in this DG particularly, in setting up these new financial instruments that are proposed uh, for the next programming period, but basically not just for the next programming period. These instruments are also meant to um, be very instrumental in this uh, COVID uh, crisis situation and particularly in the recovery phase, because we all hope that the emergency phase is finished and now we will, we will move to recovery phase. And obviously these new instruments such as react to you um, to a certain extent also JTF, uh, uh, they will play a very, very, very important role, and we are we are trying to uh, start setting them up uh, in parallel, waiting for the decisions for from co-legislators because this is very important to know the concrete parameters. But today I'm supposed to talk, I think, about cities and and how what funding will be available for cities in the years to come. And this is, of course, the topic which is close to my heart because I've been dealing with urban policy in this DG for for close to nine years. And um, just to follow up on what previous speaker said, our German friend is that we also look forward very much to the German presidency. We still hope that the plans for Leipzig Charter and the revision of EU urban and territorial agenda will be one of the priorities for German presidency, because we know that obviously this, uh, the, the having an agreement on the MFF and the, the future programs or, or budget and, and budgetary programs from EU is, is of course a priority for everybody. So on both of these issues, we of course are working very closely together um, with the member states and particularly with the presidency countries. So, provided that there is an agreement, of course, of the MFF, we can also start more actively and preparing our programs. Uh, of course, we have been engaged with member states already and our managing authorities everywhere in member states and regions uh, to um, discuss the new set of programs, of cohesion policy programs after post-2020. And... Um, there we have tried, as I've spoken before, we have tried to streamline, we have tried to pick up uh, the elements which we believe make sense, which is continuity principle, at the same time to make our programs more simple, I mean simpler, so simplification is a key word. Uh, 
But obviously, when it comes to funding for urban areas, we are we will be proposed to continue with certain elements which would uh, favor, you know, urban areas uh, receiving um, adequate funding. Uh, at the same time, knowing that, uh, you know, even under thematic calls and thematic priorities, uh, urban areas are the ones who benefit a lot. Um, and I am always against this very artificial split of urban and rural, um, because we do advocate now the funding for functional territories, which in ideal case is composed from both from urban functional areas. Uh, I mean, urban centers and, and surrounding uh, rural areas. So what have we foreseen for the new period? And I will start with that because to me, this is still the key element is a new set of cohesion, of cohesion policy programs. Uh, we under five new policy objectives. And there we obviously see that uh, the cities will benefit a lot from uh, different types of funding. Obviously under the first policy objective, it's more linked to innovation and uh, support to small and medium sized enterprises in that context. And we will be working hard to pursue further the concept of smart specialization strategies as a key enabling condition, which I'm sure you know very well. And also, obviously, one of our key work streams is to find also more synergies with central programs. And I think we have a good now window of opportunity to make sure that also the links between Horizon Europe and our cohesion fund programs are strengthened and simplified. To, 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 to say that, obviously, um, we have to work uh, on the green uh, part of our programs. And there again, I think cities play a very important role because to achieve the objectives which we have set at the EU level for the Green Deal, um, it's very important that our urban authorities are engaged through the process. So it's, it is about the legislation, it is about uh, different regulations, and I know that some of them are planned from the Commission side. But it is also about channeling the right funding through our policy objective too, and also in future just fund. When we look at the just fund, and there I touch quickly because this fund is supposed to help uh, our uh, regions, our uh, member states and regions to mitigate the actions of uh, um, impact of this energy transition, um, basically re reducing CO2 emissions going away from coal mines and, and heavy industry to something which is better fit, I think, uh, for our economic structure. Uh, and for our future, um, the JUST fund will be relevant also for cities because the way we approach it is not just, you know, the one common in the rural area. It is about, again, addressing territories. And I'm very happy that at the core of the JUST transition fund, we have the one key enabling condition. It is a territorial transition plan. We are negotiating now with many member states and regions um, because we already, the reform DG has launched already the assistance call to produce these plans and we will need to come quickly up with an agreement which territories we are covering. And I'm sure that within those territories, urban areas and cities will play an important, very important role because uh, I only see uh, this economic diversification of those regions which will uh, need to go through a very deep energy transition is in close cooperation between different areas, rural, urban, and only together by looking at these territories as such, I think we can achieve the, the, the right effect on our people. They, they can maintain jobs or get new jobs and also the sustainability of life will improve. So I see that cities will play an important role under our policy objective too, and in future also about our just fund. And as I said, for us, just fund is not really a purely energy transition fund. It's a fund for economic diversification, which very well fits into our policy objective five thinking, which is a new policy objective we are proposing to you, to our, man to our uh, managing authorities and all stakeholders, is to try to see whether um, this, um, by putting aside slightly a, a big thematic priorities, which are very, very relevant, we could still also have better targeted investment at the local and municipal level, saying that if you have uh, an integrated uh, sustainable development strategy and if it prioritizes certain areas, which maybe do not fit into thematic priorities, we can still do it if they are so important for your local development. Obviously, 
it, it's in the context of a very important discussion between stakeholders. The preconditions are a strategy and the real dialogue uh, on the, between different levels of governance. Um, and this is why I think also policy objective five will allow us to address uh, the needs of functional territories. We would like to see the PO5, the money which will be allocated under this policy objective to really support the establishment and governance and then the functioning of functional territories because we cannot afford that this policy objective is abused and is simply an envelope for each local authority. There are other principles, this is a different thinking we want to attach to the funding for this policy objective. Obviously, we still have infrastructure connectivity in the future programming period, very important for many cities. Um, there, uh, it's not, it's, it's of course uh, transport, energy and digital. For me, urban mobility, wherever it is placed in a new program uh, setup, PO2, PO3, I don't know where else, uh, urban mobility is one of the key priorities we need to work with. We know that the transport sector is a key bottleneck for cities, for greening them, for, for, for you know, allowing people to move uh, freely and so on and so forth, um, for clean air, for everything. It's one of the biggest obstacles. We know that and this is why we plan to pursue this work together with DG, our DGs like DG Move Environment to see what more, how more prominently we can feature. I think there are ideas to include it also under the Just Fund as one of the priorities. We obviously wouldn't mind that because it makes sense. And we see that whether there is the right demand because we always thought that under the new set of cohesion policy funding, under new programs, we can address urban mobility and we must address it in the best possible way. But obviously there are also other priority themes for cities which we need to work on to make them maybe more prominent. So all social part of PO4 remains important. I think cities are suffering from different forms of, uh, of uh, social problems. I mean, we were talking about a lot about migrants integration, but it's not only that. There are marginalized areas which we need to address through PO4 or PO5. Now we know that in the new regulatory framework, culture and tourism is, is now featured in, under the policy objective four. This is one of the lessons learned from the coronavirus crisis. So we need to think together how this priority to support culture and tourism, both in cities, but again, mostly we would be talking about functional areas, is how we do it in the best way. Uh, I think it's relevant for all cities. We have a partnership for cultural heritage under the urban agenda. We have been looking at different aspects of support to this particular theme. And I think now we are well placed to do it uh, better in future. Um, and then obviously, as, as I spoke about PO5, but to me, obviously cities can benefit from the range of measures under all policy objectives. and. There, of course, the integrated approach means that we have to look at synergies between different policy objectives. Now we can do it through the programming, through different multi-priority axes in our programs, but we also encourage to continue with a set with the, with the concept of the ITI, Integrated Territorial Initiatives. And of course, for locally, for CLLDs, we also make, have to make sure that these local initiatives are deported, supported. But I am I'm one to push forward also other types of support for local, for crowdfunding from our funds and so on and so forth. And we are looking at other forms of support to more support local initiatives, not just CLLDs. So I, what I'm saying is that all these instruments, we already tried them in this period. They work in many cases. We have ITI sets up cities, know what it means. Uh, we try to simplify as much as we can and better target, but I think we should explore all possibilities. This will be part of our negotiations, our managing authorities, member states and regions to set up to have a right mix of instruments available for our cities to participate in our programs. And there I would of course rely and count on the cities being very active part of our dialogue. This is an obligation under the funds uh, uh, regulatory framework and we, we quite uh, insist on that. And obviously we will continue our direct contact with cities through our cities forum, which has become a tradition. The last one was in Porto. I hope you were there. Um, we will continue. We are working now with Poland to see how we can do it together with the World Urban Forum maybe. 
uh, very important international dimension uh, to our urban policy, of course. So then obviously I have to mention last, uh, uh, the new instrument React EU, I don't want to comment much. We are in the process of working out the mo uh, parameters and modalities for this instrument. But it's very important that we will continue with urban earmarking, which, you know, is not about really amounts of funding because we know that uh, cities receive much more than 6% proposed in the current regulation across the board. It is about empowering cities and making them, you know, giving them a possibility to choose their priorities and to choose the right projects within our programs. But we are also proposing the new European Urban Initiative where we streamline all the support that there is under one instrument. So it will support innovative actions in cities directly uh, as we do it now and we have 75 cities already benefiting from this instrument and we want to cap capitalize on that but also we want to enhance obviously the uh, links with the EU urban agenda which we support now also uh, and uh, also obviously the knowledge sharing which is different networks capitalizing on the lessons learned from different instruments starting with our mainstream programs urban innovative actions but then as uh, one of the previous speakers said there are many other instruments from which we can learn and where cities can actively participate obviously we will keep chairing the inter-service group in the commission as a, as a dg and see whether we can also escalate this cooperation better to our political levels but uh, certainly we will actively we, we we would really like to to have active feedback also from cities constantly whether their needs are correctly addressed through our mainstream programs, cohesion fund programs, but also through our central instruments such as urban innovative actions and the future European urban initiative. Um, so I probably I should stop there because um, unless you want me to talk more, uh, but uh, I can assure you that uh, in DG Regio, um, we are friends of all territories, obviously. We are looking forward to new EU territorial agenda. Uh, but I think we all should think about how we work together uh, because functional area concept is the only one which can survive in the future. We need to cooperate better beyond our administrative borders. But obviously, um, work with urban authorities for us uh, will be a big priority. I just had a discussion with our commissioner on the way forward on different aspects in our work with cities and we will try to, to talk to you and, and even better prioritize certain thematics depending on the size of a city because we know that one recipe cannot fit all cities. You are very different and so we recognize. So thank you for having me today. I'm happy to answer some questions if you have. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for this very insightful uh, contribution and full of uh, important information. Um, we have a few questions. Um, I think that perhaps there is one directly to Mr. Poppins. Uh, uh, the others are more general, so any of the panelists could answer the questions who feel that um, has some, some reactions on the question. So first I will start with the question directly to, to Mr. Poppins. Uh, the question is that uh, um, it says that the question here is not only for cities to have more EU resources, but also have direct access to EU funds. Do you see new opportunities for this in the new programming period? Comes from Katalin Halmai, journalist from Hungarian newspaper Nipsala. <clears throat> um, you, should, you should unmute your micro. Yeah, now I'm fine. Yeah, technologies. <laughs> it's a good question, and obviously we 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 discussed a lot this question in Porto in our cities forum. It was raised quite prominently that the the fact that cities would like to have more access to our direct programs from the EU, from the which are run by the Commission or entrusted entities. 
we, we, we need to see it in a balance because obviously cities, as I said, it's not just about giving money to a city. It is about city playing an important role in the context of local, territorial, regional, and then the, the national level development. Cities are a key part of this development. And we cannot just take out the city and say, now, okay, you, you will receive direct funding from EU budget. From the EU budget and from ERDF and cohesion fund and ESF, cohesion policy funds, we try to really support uh, this broader view on territories. And this is something which is very important. It is new. And within that context, of course, we, we want to give more say to relevant urban authorities who have capacity to produce good projects um, and this is why I think the key for us is to work the model within the mainstream programs under the fact that we need to have six percent of uh, funding going directly to cities which we continue with there obviously we have to make sure that the cities can do have a say on getting access also to the shared management programs Okay, and I think that is the biggest challenge. When it comes to direct funding, this is why we introduced Urban Innovative Actions. Urban Innovative Actions is also funded from the cohesion policy, but that's a direct instrument and their cities can come with their projects and I would like to encourage everybody in future also to come back uh, to try to apply to this instrument because obviously it's a success story because we have very good projects funded from that instrument and we will be working more we will have to see particularly for cities also for example bigger programs like horizon they also have urban part and there is a city's mission under the horizon and this is something where we want to cooperate also with DGRTT more in, to see whether cities can also have better access to those bigger programs such as Horizon Europe and um, you know our German colleague mentioned CEF um, I don't know CEF is really a, a program which co covers mostly transnational uh, uh, connections I mean trans-European connections but why not? I mean, we should look at all programs. So I think there are programs which are available for everybody, but it's true that we, we need to see that um, these, uh, there is uh, this demand, but don't imagine that there will be only one central program for cities or something. I mean, we need to work on cities participating through the shared management programs, regional and national, in the mainstream funding from cohesion policy. To me, it's key. And we need to look at the synergies with rural areas. I think we will come up with a communication on the future of rural areas. And the way I see it, it's only in connection uh, with urban areas and development as a functional territory. And we will keep supporting cities, obviously. We have also with EIB the Urbis Initiative, where cities directly can go to EIB, get the assistance, and we will try to link it in future with our Jasper's assistance. So the cities, when they have ideas about good projects, so whichever instruments they are covered, because let's say EIB also has very good instruments uh, available for cities. Um, that the cities can get adequate assistance uh, to prepare these projects and actually get the funding for them. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, not more than 10 minutes left, so I, I just, uh, perhaps I, I make some questions and I try to merge some similar ones. One is exactly about the issue, Mr. Poppins, you mentioned that uh, the participation of cities in the planning and uh, application management of, of EU, uh, EU funds, uh, that uh, the partnership principle, uh, how to make it uh, more than just a ticking exercise for the, for the members, so what can uh, the European institutions can do uh, to really to uh, enforce uh, the member state governments to uh, um, take it seriously, uh, the partnership with the cities, Again, another question that the urban agenda, um, where the national contact points are, are appointed by the national governments, uh, what about to include the cities in, uh, in, or to become national contact points as they are really the ones who are interested in the urban agenda. So how the cities' participation in planning and, and applying and uh, management of EU funds 
for uh, cities can be strengthened? That's one of the questions, and I think that that's a question for all of the panelists. Um, we have a question regarding the recovery plan, um, that how do you see uh, that the recovery plan could be better um, fit to the needs of the, uh, the cities? Um, at its present form, um, it concentrates on the central governments. Um, yes, uh, and we have one question about uh, basic income. If um, um, what about creation of money like the basic income, which permit to eradicate the modern slavery uh, jobs? Uh, I think perhaps it's quite uh, not very closely related to the issue. But if you have any ideas on on basic income, of course, I'm I'm more than happy to to listen to that. Now, perhaps uh, these are the most important questions. Uh, is there anyone who would like to start to answer to, to, the, to the questions? Uh, just uh, unmute your micro and you can start. Perhaps I could say a few words because I will have to leave you very soon, but I see that uh, there are many questions related to recovery plan, for example. And there, obviously, we are working. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's fine. Good. So I wanted to say that, obviously, we are now... Um, I think we should focus a lot on the new set of programs. Uh, yes, there are specific instruments which are very, very important for the moment, React EU, and, and also we, we have made a lot of efforts to unblock all possible cent or possible euro that there is under the current period, 1420 financial period, to help to, to cope with the crisis. And you have to understand, and everybody has to understand that this was necessary. The, the way that we see it also here uh, in the commission is that uh, the crisis has impact all across Europe in such, to such an extent that we had to go away from some of the principles of thematic concentration, of urban earmarking, and the flexibility. we had to introduce a lot of flexibilities because in fact, not so much money was, av was available. And we needed to make sure that the health system needs uh, receives additional support, that SMEs across the board, be it in a city or somewhere in a rural area, that small and medium-sized enterprises quickly benefit from, you know, support to the working capital, that the wage schemes for uh, people to, to keep them in work, uh, but uh, needs to be done and also vulnerable group groups being there. So that needed to be done and there's a limited amount. So I think for these years, we should be, we have to focus on that. So also under react EU, we have to see, and, and I think that clearly in our regulation, our proposal, it spells out the types of measures we would want to fund under react EU. Um, and normally, yes, they, they would have to go, would cover the whole country or the whole region at least, because otherwise, you know, it will be inconsistencies. And if you, if you support working capital and SMEs, you can't do it in one city and don't do it in the next city in the same member state, right? So I think it makes sense that the React EU instrument, which is one of the instruments under recovery phase, helps under such a schemes. By saying that at the same time, we want to pay attention also to the regional dimension of, uh, of this, uh, these instruments to make sure that those regions who suffer the most from the crisis also receive you know, the most funding to recover, uh, but without creating these balances. It's easy to say, not so easy to achieve, but we will try to do that. We will try to work with member states to make sure that also if there are urban areas which suffered the most that they do receive adequate funding. But we really need to work together with our managing authorities because there is also a time limit on this money. But for the medium and long term, I would really suggest that we focus on the on the all funding which will be available after MFF is approved for the set of our mainstream programs and territorial cooperation programs. And there I think with cities we have very good work streams established, part of it under the urban agenda, which is intergovernmental process, 
and part of it under our direct contacts so through our forums and networks. We have a special network run by the Commission with cities and, and also VIB. So it's a lot of channels to have good cooperation and we always pay, pay attention to that. There is a problem when I see when I see the questions on direct funding that I do believe, and there's probably our, our my German colleague could say more on, on also the approach in intergovernmental process, is sometimes a lack of a national level dialogue, sort of a national level urban agenda. Because there is an EU urban agenda, then there is a funding from EU. But in the middle, there has to be a, a reasonable dialogue between cities, regional governments, national governments, and also hopefully urban, urban rural linkages addressed. So I think this is very key that we push for that. Zagreb City was asking how to access directly. Yes, we will dispatch our solidarity fund help to sit to, to member states who suffered. But we have to do it at the national level. And I do hope that then based on a dialogue with the city of Zagreb, the national government will, you know, objectively give this funding, allocate this funding to the zones which suffered most from the earthquake. So we have all these instruments at EU level in place, but we also have to make sure that every level of governance does its own job. And we are ready to support cities in, in every possible way. We are keen to, you know, come up with more instruments and priorities. But I think the big work is also to make sure that there is a national level co cooperation between cities and different levels of governance. And to me, this is a key to success in future also. Thanks. Yes, thank you. And uh, Monica Vanna signaled that uh, she has a reaction to the basic income issue. And then Katarina Erdmenger also uh, wants to contribute. Monica, it's you. Thank you very much, Spencer, because I, let, I, I have to leave sharply at 12, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, just for basic income, I think uh, it's strongly related also to cities because, for example, you know, the city of Vienna has introduced a kind of uh, child guarantee and basic income for children. So every level can introduce, if he wants, the national level, the city level, regional level, or EU level. And, you know, uh, President... Uh, uh, von der Leyen at the Commission introduced her plans on minimum wages for this period. I think this is very, very important. I hope the German presidency will push it, but it's not enough, of course. We prefer the term uh, minimum income, by the way, not basic income, uh, to show that we think that it should not be automatically paid to everyone. So so um, uh, 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 simply said, not to all the rich, for example, but uh, to those in need. So minimum income is on the table, I think. And uh, what we need, and there is our topic on all levels and in all our institution, what we need is, of course, to safeguard the framework and the possibilities for all levels, EU level, national level and uh, city levels, to have the possibility to invest in social policy, be it basic income, minimum income or other social um, uh, measures. This is crucial because uh, only with massive investments we come out of those crap of this crisis and for us greens it, it means also to say it clear to be more flexible with the stability and growth pact because the stability and growth pact and uh, including the austerity policy of the last years uh, it prevented uh, for example the national level for having possibility to invest for example in labor market and social uh, social security. So to take out uh, some uh, investments, for example, in social policy, out of the criteria for the stability and growth pact, uh, you know, the cities uh, claim that for years now, they call it the golden rule. Uh, this would be one interesting solution. And we see it very critical as Greens that the recovery plan will be, by, uh, will be bound very much to the European semester. You know, also the so-called macroeconomic conditionalities in the regional policy. Uh, we think that's really not a good idea in these times of crisis because we have to save investments, especially in social policy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, then, uh, Ms. Erdmenger, uh, the floor is yours. And then we have time, not more than one more uh, contribution. And uh, Katalin Che uh, signaled that she would like to, to react. So sorry for, for everyone, but we have to come to the end. And Mr. Eduard Donauer from the city of Bratislava uh, is really ready to give the closing remarks. So Ms. Ernanga, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. No, I, I just wanted to react a bit um, to a lot of what um, Norman Poppins was saying and, and um, trying to, to answer the questions as well. Um, I think, I mean, I, if I may be a bit more blunt uh, than I would normally maybe be, but just to make my, my point clearer, as a city, it's really important um, that you don't sit there and think who is going, uh, do, where is the one-stop shop where I can get money from the European Union? Um, that would be the one program for cities and that's not going to happen. Um, but the, the idea is to, to be also a bit creative as a city and to see where would I fit into what, are, what the Euro, different European programs do with, with my ideas. Uh, I know this is really complicated. If you're not that familiar with European funding, um, it, you need help for that. And we were very aware, aware um, of that. So that is why we're thinking about this idea of you know, these national contact points or more governance structure in the urban agenda, whatever you might call it, um, so that you actually get access to that kind of uh, information and get, get support for that. But it's it's really, really inter um, important that you think, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a super urban development project here uh, and where do I fit um, into what the uh, the programs are? And it's, it's, it's um, very important to go um by by the topics and i mean you know with all what is going to happen on the green deal and on the recovery um and on uh, as norman was describing the the um and reactive program and the just transition um i'm sure you all have this idea of saying how can i you know um have a greener city uh invest in my public transport to reduce co2 emissions um uh have a um local um by local initiatives incorporating my surrounding urban areas you know um i'm sure you're all doing that um and then you have to try to to, to actually fit it into the um um the program and transport actually it was a very very uh, sort of um promising field to work on um as well as for local transport and then you can actually also go to the to the um the interact the cooperation programs um, and then also the, you know, to come back to that one, the, the Connecting Europe facility. Um, there's really good examples from the cities of Frankfurt and Berlin, actually, who've um, invested, wanted to invest in the improvement of their urban mobility programs, and they wanted to have more uh, electric chains in uh, in their cities. And then they found out that there are actually nodes, so-called urban nodes, in the trans-European networks. And so they got money from the trans-European networks. To improve the urban transport, uh, and by the way, it was also a greening initiative because it was really investing in the electric uh, trains in, the, in the cities, because that um, actually alleviated congestion um, on the on the urban networks, and then it's easier for the sort of trans-European transport to get through um, if we have an extra track for the urban transport for the electric trains. So that, all that kind of thing. I mean, I'm sure you're all working on a kind of initiative and try and fit it into the existing programs. And I, I appreciate this is a very difficult thing, so which is why I, I think, yes, indeed, uh, that's why you need support. And as I said, that that's what we're trying to um, um, to work on. Um, and then, um, as Norman was asking me about the um, uh, uh, national coordination uh, policies and who would appoint a national contact point and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we've, we have a tradition of having a national uh, urban policy in, um, in, in Germany. It's also more funding uh, thing, a national funding thing. Um, well, you know, in our case in Germany, if, if, if we try to have a network with cities only, um, the regions would be eyeing us really suspiciously. <laughs> so uh, that's again, that's our complexity in Germany. Uh, but I'm sure you have all your complexities in your respective <laughs> member states. Uh, but uh, indeed, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure again, every member state will have a nucleus around which you can develop that. And then if you try to develop European structures, um, certainly there's by that vehicle, you can also try hardware and, and work on your national structure because, of course, it's more easy to, to communicate on a European level if, if you have that kind of channel, I would say. But there again, I mean, you know, um, no one size fits all. Every state has to, member state has to find a way of doing it. And again, we, even from the national German government, we have a very, um, not very strong position to sort of push that too much from top down. Um, anyway, just um, to give you this, this insight that I, I, I really like you to, to, to understand that, that um, the art of European funding is, is not about sitting there and waiting for someone to come along and saying this is the program for cities. Um, it is a really important issue. I mean, it's, it, I'm not saying that we don't want it to make it easy for cities, but 
it's a cross-cutting subject. Uh, and if you think about a city again as, as, some, as, a, as an organism which is having an integrated development, um, then you have to also in the funding to be cross-cutting in your thinking and say, um, I have many topics I'm working on and then I'm going to find the right uh, way of funding. Of course, I appreciate it. it would be much easier if you could say um, there is money to support exactly that process of integrated development. But then again, there we have the ITIs and, and you could see what you could do with that. Again, I know an ITI is a very complicated affair, but again, it's at least the idea behind it is to say we will give um, money to a city or to uh, a certain territorial unit um, so that it can work on this integrated development. Okay. And then, okay. apologies also from my side, but I really also have to dash <laughs> next meeting is uh, coming up. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I have to leave. But thanks again um, for um, inviting me. And, and um, I really um, enjoyed contributing to this debate and listening also to, to what the, the mayors had to say that was really uh, important for all that we're planning to do with the uh, Leipzig Charter. Uh, later in our presidency. Yeah, and then hopefully again it will be a physical one in Leipzig um, to talk about the new Leipzig Saga. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you for being with us and um, I give the floor for a short um, comment to Katalin Cher and then uh, to Mr. Donauer. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. I will be brief because, uh, well, we discussed so uh, many things already. I just want to reflect, like, very shortly on a on Mr. Uh, Norm Nor Norman's Popens's uh, remarks, uh, and uh, here uh, you said that. Um, the funding requests from cities uh, should be filtered through the national level or the, like the national level should be involved in the financing. And um, well, I do appreciate obviously this approach, but I, I think that we might look uh, to new, re uh, new areas also, because if the national government has to be involved, the direct funding is not direct, it goes through the national government. And uh, in the case uh, that was mentioned, uh, I think, by some of our speakers, Sometimes the national government is the problem, either because of the bureaucracy, either because of the centralization, either because of corruption or for other uh, issues. So I, I do understand and I appreciate that the current funding streams are run in such a manner, but maybe we should be a bit more uh, open minded in the uh, current stage of planning and uh, not to treat the exclusivity and uh, of, of the national government's over control and oversight uh, as a paradigm. Uh, so I, I would just like to make a point to make direct fundings between commission and regions or cities like really direct. And I think that we are ha we have a lot of good practices to look into to expand uh, because this is uh, for me the solution for so many of the problems uh, we addressed during this seminar. But otherwise, I would just like to thank all of you for uh, this very interesting conversation. And I can't uh, wait to indeed to uh, have a discussion in under normal circumstances as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before giving the floor to, to uh, Mr. Dona, we are just uh, very, two very short uh, technical remarks. Of course, we will send all the materials, including the um, PowerPoint presentation and uh, the position paper we prepared to all the participants of this uh, seminar and feel free to use them. So no copyright, no, it, it's a copyleft approach to, to everything we, uh, we, we pre prepared. And also, I would like to say thank you for all of the speakers who joined us today, shared uh, their, their views, contributed to, uh, to this discussion. Um, and uh, I hope that we can continue this very fruitful conversation in different levels and fora, uh, including the European Parliament and the Council discussions and the interinstitutional uh, uh, discussions in the coming days and, and weeks. And now I, I really give the floor to uh, Eduard Bonauer, who is uh, representing the city of Bratislava. Unfortunately, Mayor Valo was not able to join us today, but Mr. Donauer gives us a closing remarks some wrap up of, of the meeting, and uh, perhaps we can get something from, uh, from the Bratislava uh, perspective of the question. The floor is yours. Thank you. Greetings from Bratislava City, and thank you very much for the opportunity to make the closing remarks uh, of this conference. 
Uh, as we heard today, uh, the sustainable development is highly relevant um, topic at every level of public administration and society as a whole, uh, however, especially at its urban dimension. In the near future, we will have to be ready to accept many compromises in our lives and behavior, aimed at this time not only at higher shared good, but also at the survival, if not that of ourselves, then that of the future generations to which we have a moral commitment. The expectation of endless growth is not realistic, uh, and this illusion is being gradually abandoned. But every challenge also represents the opportunity to change and to reach a new equilibrium. European Union and its cohesion policy uh, significant, is significantly helping the public administration to strengthen its resilience to the new challenges, but the urban dimension needs to be fostered continually. Cities can be the key players in communicating and implementing European priorities and values uh, so that citizens can understand and engage in them. In terms of the principle of subsidiarity, the level of cities is the level of democratic institutions where citizens as well as stakeholders can meaningfully participate and at the same time see almost immediately the positive effect of cooperation. It had been clearly demonstrated that uh, it is advantageous for people to be close uh, to one another to associate and cooperate. On the other hand, the concentration of people creates a heavy environmental pressure as well as the pressure on public health due to industrial production, transfer and consumption. To achieve an equilibrium between the advantages and disadvantages, or ideally, or ideally to tilt the equilibrium toward the good of society, individuals and institutions uh, must moderate their pursuit of own comfort and perceive themselves as part of a larger whole. This shift should be supported by the city's investments into the project, fostering the sustainability uh, and resiliency of the physical urban space as well as the social resiliency and institutional resiliency, which are equally important. The cities are today seen as the providers of services which ensure the satisfaction of the demands and needs of its inhabitants. But this concept is not sustainable in the long run because no public institution has the resources that are sufficient to maintain even the current status quo, not to speak the further development activities. In order to convince the general public of the need to change the way of daily life and to continue to increase the resilience of the urban environment, the great efforts and increased funding will be needed. However, to ensure sustainability, it is necessary to build partnerships, those between different levels of public administration on one hand and opening up to partners from the private and civil sectors on the other hand. And the city must become a platform, a living ecosystem of individuals and other entities that understand one another have shared objectives and the ability to join forces in implemented concrete activities and projects. In this area, we must intensify our efforts to communicate the priorities and activities of the cities and to open up processes for partnership cooperation. In Bratislava, we welcome uh, and we are very optimistic about the possibility of implementing integrated territorial investments under a sustainable urban development instrument and the possibility of combining financial sources and capacities across institutions to achieve the political objectives and sustainable development goals of cohesion policy. The city of Bratislava, in cooperation with the Bratislava region, played steering role in designing the agreement uh, of the future mechanism of implementing integrated territorial investments in Slovakia. The data and mutual dialogue will serve as a basis for defining strategic objectives and priorities of the city and the region and on the national level as well, meeting the expectations of the inhabitants and other entities presented in the city and for mobilizing their ability and willingness to take part in the implementation. We expect that this process will ultimately make the city and its uh, priorities easier to understand and that jointly defined strategic orientation will also contribute to its joint implementation with the aim of achieving the necessary changes. As soon as we embark on cooperation, which will prove its benefits and advantages for all, we will get accustomed to it and as a social standard, even though it will call for considerable coordination efforts. The first and the most important change consists in the need to change the perception of which matters and we should be concerned about and to realize that we will never achieve individually as much as we can achieve together. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And again, thank you for all to be with us. Thank you for the technical staff who supported this uh, discussion uh, behind and without uh, whom we wouldn't have able to, uh, to have this exchange of views. Uh, let's continue the discussion and uh, have a nice day. Mm -hmm.